لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله. الحمد لله. We've got to try and wrap up the presentation of public speaking today because tomorrow I'm going to cover another topic on leadership, the old and the new way of leading. So we've got quite a lot to cover in this one and a half, one hour, 15 minutes. But I thought that I'll start with two very uh, useful clips of Sheikh Ahmed Didat and another one after that, before we get into the actual presentation. So sh short clips there. He didn't do anything, you know? Not. Reuben, he had he, he has sex with his mother. He had sex with his mother. God said nothing. But Judah had intercourse with his brother in law. And if you get the children, the great grandfathers of your God, Jesus Christ. The children of incest. Children of incest, your great great grandfathers of your God. You know Samuel, he talks about one of the sons of David, David and his sister. God said nothing. The other guy, he raised ten of his father's wives. And God said nothing. But for a man to be into the box, he goes and kills 50,000 empty persons. Is this in the book of God? Is this God? Okay. 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 Please tell us in the book of God. And the young. I don't question God. He is my own artifact. Yes. 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 I'm asking the Christian, the Westerner, who speaks English, you said person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, I want to know what language are you talking? <laughs> is that English? I'm asking, is that English? That's given. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. And Bishop Wakey in his book, in his book, it just happens to be here. He, he's written about the doctrine of the Trinity, attributes of God, Trinity, the triune God. And at the end of his essay on the Trinity, Bishop says, he says, yet there are not three God, but only one God. One God only, as seen in the previous section. Therefore, therefore, we conclude that there are three persons in the unity of the Godhead. And the support is 1 John 5 7. 1 John 5 7. 1 John 5 7. What I'm asking is, I want you to find that for me in this Bible of mine. Okay. Uh, there have been several omissions and some of my impression. I don't agree with them. So that's where I stand. So I'm asking who omitted that? That verse is thrown out of the fabrication in the RSV. Divine standard version. Yes, I understand. Who, who did this type of divine standard version? Not Jews, not Hindus, not Muslims. But 32 scholars of the highest eminence, Christian scholars of the highest eminence, But I, I'm glad he refers to it. 
He's giving a lot of good scriptures tonight. That's terrific. Uh, now, that one verse is not the only one I do. But I Okay, before we go on to the next clip, the first one both that you clips. saw. That's both clips. <coughs> both clips are big. Yeah, until this we finish with that. Yeah. We'll go on to the next one, but before we go on to the next one. So, that first clip that you saw, where yeah. Chef Didat was having a discussion with the person in his office, what that quite clearly shows is that he knew what he was saying very, very well. He was talking to the Christian from the Christian scriptures, various scriptures, and after saying whatever he had to say after a few minutes, the Christian said, this Bible, I need to throw it into the bin. Right? So in public speaking, what you need to know is that you need to know your topic very, very well. Right? And if you know your topic well, then your half your battle is won. Then the second part is just to get it across. So one is the content, you need to know your contents very well which he was a master at, and getting it across also, you saw the second clip, right? And how he was able to uh, defeat actually the, the other person who was debating with him from his own scripture, from his own book, which means that Sheikh did that to do a lot of homework. Not only of the Bible, but also against homework of the person who he was debating against. So here he pulled out a book which was written 47 years earlier, and if he's arguing with that person from what he's written, can have any argument. That person can't argue because in black and white, this is what he's written. One of his greatest uh, debates was against Gilchrist. Uh, John Gilchrist. John Gilchrist, one of the top uh, evangelists in America and the world at the time. And when he had a debate against him, he mentioned, Sheikh Didat mentioned, that I bought all 17 of the books that you've written and I've read all 17 of them for one debate. It shows you need to know your work very well before you can even speak uh, to the Christians and also especially if you can have debates with them you need to know it very well and here's a typical example of how well he used to prepare and therefore to win debates was very simple for him but a lot of work went into it. But we'll discuss this later as we're going along. Now I'm going to play on another clip, please. Just listen very, very carefully. Okay, whilst we waiting for that other clip to come on, some of the things that we're going to be discussing today. And what I've tried to do today, I've changed my whole presentation for today, and I tried to give you as much uh, examples from the life of our Holy Prophet Wasallam on whatever we're going to be discussing. So I left out a lot of the things that I had previously prepared. Some of the things that we're going to be discussing is how to make a good first impression. So, when you are going to speak, and before you even open your mouth, from the time that you walk into the venue, people are watching you. And they're already making up their minds about you, without even you uttering one word. So your first impression is very, very important. That's very, very important. For example, if you are sitting in a shopping center waiting for someone who's doing shopping and you're waiting for them, or you're sitting in an airport lounge and you're waiting for your plane, and people are walking past. Whilst people are walking past, you are already in your mind <coughs> making up your mind about that person. Who is he? What nationality? What work he or she might be doing? Where are they going? Isn't that so? without the person even uttering one word. Similarly with public speaking. From the time that you walk in, people are observing you and they're already making up their minds about you. Therefore, the first impression is absolutely, absolutely important. So, one of the things that we're going to be discussing is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked. How did he walk? Anyone? How did he walk? 
Yes, how did he walk? He walked fast. He walked fast. He walked straight. Yes, what else? I think you should new for us. Uh, Sorry? This is new, new posture for me. I have no okay. Steady, but not fast, not, not too slow. Not too fast, not too slow. Yeah. With confidence. Steady, with confidence. Yes. Anything yeah. else? Uh, just like if he just coming from up to down. Yes. Like yeah. It was as if he was walking downhill. Yes? Okay, yeah, let's do it. Okay, I think we've got it now, so let's just play that first. Okay, we play it again. Play full screen. No, no, then take it out, take it out. Take it out. Take it out, take it out. Take it out. Take it out. Take it out. Yeah, you close this. Okay, no, then what we need to do is what we need to do is go on to. Yeah, just clear this up. Clear that. Okay, so why is we so we getting it directly from the YouTube show? Okay, so the one point is, is correct. It was as if he was walking down here, right? Compared to how the other Sahaba were walking, as far as the speed is concerned, was he walking their, their speed faster or slower? Hmm? Faster. Or as as they as they walk. As they walk. If you if you converse, he's alone, separate. He's faster. When he walked to the other, yes. he did do it with their blame. Okay. okay. So some of the things is that also he walked, he, he did not look on his side when he walked. He walked straight. And secondly, compared to all the other Sahaba, he walked much faster than them. Not faster than them. It appeared, to, compared to them, he walked faster than them. He walked faster than them. And it was his normal walk. He wasn't walking fast. But compared to them, he was faster. So sometimes, I'll show you the hadith. Sometimes he's here, and in a moment he's there, in a moment he's there. That, that's how they describe his walk. And when he walked, he picked up his legs firmly and brought them down slowly. And he was bent. It appeared as if he was bent when he was walking. <laughs> and he gave the appearance as if he was walking down here. Right, so these are some of the things. So what, what, what we can learn from that also is that when we are walking in, we must walk confidently, look straight, have a smile on our faces, don't walk too slowly, not too fast, but must walk briskly and show the confidence that you have. Okay, one of the other things that we're going to be discussing is Prophet's gestures, what he did with his hands. So can anyone tell me what are some of the things that the Prophet did with his hands? hands? Yes. When he spoke. Uh, he joins them. He points. He joins them? Mm -hmm. Yes. He points. How does he point? Just pointing. Point like that? When he's speaking to people? To people no. 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 He didn't point at them when he spoke to them. So when he spoke to them, how did he point? Point with the open palm. Open palm, correct? No, 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 no. Yes. What else? What else did he do with his hands? When he made dua, he yes, he raised his hands when he made dua. Okay. Anything else? Any, anything? anything? Hmm? He's helping people. Any, anyone with a healthy? Yes. Something he will do okay. Hand, did he touch people when he spoke to them? Yes, yes. He spoke to them, he touched them. Okay. Did he gesture in any way with his hands and arms? 
Just share meaning. One, yeah, one hadith is saying. Yes. Uh, two people. Yes. People. Okay. Okay, so some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ did. Brother, you were giving an example. You say that Prophet ﷺ had his, yeah, uh, had his fingers together. Because, uh, so reward, Which hadith was that? The reward of people who were taking care of the uh, orphans. Orphans. Uh, okay, so when, when the, the hadith ﷺ is mentioned about the reward for a person caring for an orphan, what was uh, his gesture? He's just about like this. In fact, anyone talks about that hadith, immediately this comes to mind. Yes. So that's a gesture of the Prophet So if you look at his, the hadith of the Prophet you'll notice there's a number of gestures that he used. Even that final sermon, what did he do? He pointed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then pointed towards the Sahaba and asked whether I have conveyed the message to you. So that is very, very powerful gestures of the Prophet they just continue from where we were yesterday. And yesterday we were talking about the beginning of your speech. We said there was A, B, and A, B, C, and D. And on the A, what did A stand for? A for? Attention, grabbing attention, and what else? Attitude. Audience audience and other things regarding the audience, right? So now we move on to B, and B is, what, what is meant by W-I-I-F-M? What does that mean? What's in it for me? So when you are speaking, what you have to bear in mind is that as far as the audience is concerned, they want to know what's in it for me from what you are saying. Right? Because if they're not going to benefit from what you're saying, you're wasting your time. So that's what you must bear in mind when you're writing out your speech. Don't look at it from your point of view. Not what you want to tell them, but what do they want to hear? And then you say it in the best way. So that is, B is very, very important. What's in it for me? Thirdly, C. C is the credentials. One of the most valuable things that a person possesses is his time. Why should he give you his time? You must be worth something for him to give you his time. Right? So therefore, it is important that he must know that you have got something worthwhile to say. You could be an expert in your subject. So that is why also when people ask you for a short bio data or a CV, if you are speaking anywhere, don't feel shy to give it to them. It's not giving it to them out of being boastful or haughty, but it assists them for the program. And it assists the audience as well. If you are going to, a, to listen to a talk somewhere, you've never seen this person, you've never heard of him, you don't know him at all. Wouldn't it be better if you knew a little about him, yes. even if I was introduced on the day. Isn't that so? Definitely. Instead of just being taken by surprise. Yes. So therefore, it's important that your credentials should be known. So you can just pass it on to the MC. You saw the first day when uh, Mr. Amara wanted something about me, I give it to him. Right, but not out of haughtiness, but out of being of assistance to the organizer. Also, what you need to remember is that when you're giving your bio data, when you send it to the person, follow up and ask him whether he's received it. And when you are typing it out, type it out in big font. Instead of a 12 font, type it out in say 15 or 16 font. So when he gets it, and if he prints it out, he can have it quite clearly, he can read it. Now this, this might think, sound small to you, but it's very important. Because what happens sometimes, when the person, if you give it to him, and even if he prints it out, it might be so fine print that he can't even pronounce your name properly. You might even, can't even pronounce the university you went to, or what books you might have written. I had an incident once where I went to a school, and I made the presentation there to the educators, but I sent a short bio data of myself. So that teacher, what he did was, instead of printing it out, he went to the presentation, and we were almost ready to present, the lights were dimmed, because I was doing a PowerPoint presentation, 
and he's reading out the bio data from his cell phone. Now this is the size of his screen, and it is dimmed. Half the things he was reading wrong. See, so that's the point I'm making. So if you give it, so it, as I say, it's more to assist the organizers <laughs> than anything else. And the D is the direction or destination, where do you want to get to, right? And what's very, very important is what's called the tell, tell, tell formula. Especially those of you who are regularly giving talks, some of you may be given, giving talks, the Juma khutbas or other khutbas. Very important. Tell, tell, tell formula simply means tell them in the beginning what you are going to tell them. Then proceed to tell them. And at the end, tell them what you have told them. Simple. But very important. Many, many, many speakers lose their audience towards the end because they don't summarize what they've told them. Quite often when you go to Juma Khulbas, for example, 20 minutes, we're sitting there, or half an hour, and the khatib has got about five points to make. And when we leave, we try to recall the five points. Generally, we remember about two, maximum three. But if the khatib had gone over, he said, okay, we were going to discuss these five hadiths of the Prophet or the one hadith, but it had five uh, important points, and these were the points that we discussed. So when, it leave, when you leave that place, you can recall better, right? So when you're preparing your speech, in the beginning, you must tell them what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be covering. Proceed to cover it, and at the end, tell them this is what we've covered. Did I do that in this presentation? Yes. Did I tell you at the beginning what we're going to be doing for the four days? Sure. Yes, sure. What did I do? Show, more Show you that aeroplane and these were all the different things. As I finished each section, I went back and I said, okay, we finished this, now we're moving on to the second one. Did it help you? Yes. Did it help you? Yes. Clearly. Okay. <clears throat> now, what is the objective of any talk? There's only four objectives. So you must determine when you are making a speech, what is the objective of your talk? It is to inform, to train, or to teach, just as a teacher or a trainer would do, to stimulate, motivate, and inspire, like a motivational speaker, to persuade, convince, sell, or get action, debater, salesman, politician, and to amuse or entertain a comedian. There's only one of these four objectives for any speech. There's no other objective. So you must determine what is your objective. Once you've determined your objective, then you know how to prepare for it. Because at the end of the day, if you are selling something, then your whole presentation must be aimed towards being able to sell at the end. But sometimes you must remember that a person's presentation can have more than one objectives. So the person could be, for instance, he could be motivating people and also getting them to take action. So for instance, you're a dai, so you might want to inform the listeners about how to achieve success in this world and the hereafter. So that's information, motivation, and then to take action. Right? So we finished the beginning. Now let's look at the middle. Middle just is like a sandwich. The top slice is the introduction, the bottom slice is the conclusion, and in between is the actual meat, Bodies. right, the body. So that is where you need to have the main points. So as I mentioned earlier, you've got point one. Don't have more than four or five points in your speech. And then you've got sub points, second point, third point, etc. Now we go through this very quickly. Some of the principles, you know, need to know the subject thoroughly, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi knew his subject very, very well. Sheikh Ahmed did that, that's why I played you the clip, so you saw how well he knew his subject. Use facts, figures, and illustrations. Use visual aids. And for each of this, I'll give you examples, inshallah, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Use metaphors and analogies, stories and anecdotes, and humor. Right, so this is what you put in the body of your uh, presentation. Now, if you look at that farewell sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu and you look at the body of it, this is what it contained. After the very brief introduction, morality, chastity, justice, rights of women, equality, accountability, etc. So that's where your main uh, part of your speech is. And finally, the end. And we don't want, when your speech ends and you are talking, this is what's happening. You don't want that. 
Right? This means that he's lost his listeners throughout while he was speaking. So, you must end on a high note or a professional note. The conclusion should lead up to a climax. So after grabbing the attention of the audience, so in the beginning you grab the audience, the attention, the first point in the body of the speech should be good, the next one should be better, the next one should be better. So each one is building towards a climax. Right? So that is what you need to do. Okay, the brother gave me a good example the other day. An aeroplane. When are the most accidents caused? When it takes off, when it's flying, the majority of the time it's in the air, so when it's flying, or when it is landing. Landing, landing is more risky. Landing. landing is more risky. Only landing? Most when it's flying. Flying is dangerous. Landing is dangerous. And when it's flying? Yes, also. But compared to the others? <coughs> after one week. Sorry? We are doing that after one week. <laughs> we'll leave it to us. Okay, so most accidents are caused, they don't like accidents when they're taking off or when they're landing. Yeah. Apply it to your speeches. Right? Apply it to your speeches. So the biggest mistake people make is when they're starting, they don't grab the attention of the people, they lose them right from the beginning. Or towards the end, they must have done a fantastic presentation. But then it's just like a damp screw, it just fizzles away. So that is why we say you must take it to a climax and end with a very powerful ending. Your conclusion should always tie into the opening and your body. That's important. And the conclusion should also be forceful and confident. Just think of a necklace, right? So you've got beads starting there, a whole lot of other beads, and then that necklace ends again where it started. Isn't that so? Your speech must be like that. So where you start, and then you say whatever you want, and when you end up, you must come back to the beginning. Right? And look at the farewell speech of the Prophet Sallallahu farewell sermon, where he started, grabbed the attention, I want some action from you, and then he said whatever he had to say, and right at the end he said, now it is your duty to take it forward. Right? So you saw that whole, that is how it must be. I'll give you an example. The very first presentation of mine that I did, I told you it was on life is short, live life to the fullest. But the very first slide had this clock and the seconds were ticking away. Now, as far as the topic is concerned, life is short, live life to the fullest. Right? Every second, your life, you're getting closer and closer to your grave. So that we started, did the whole presentation, and at the end, this was the concluding slide. Okay, gives you an idea. So just think like a necklace, where you start off, when you come, right, come back, you must bring them right back to where you started off, okay? So, concluding, very quickly, you need to summarize the tell, tell, tell formula that we discussed. Ask a question, use a quotation, Quranic verse, or hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Tell a story, very, very powerful. Reciting a poem, I've seen a number of public speakers, when they're finishing, they've got a poem in their pocket, they take it out and they read it. Very powerful. Could be even if you're giving talks in Arabic, there's lots of beautiful Arabic poems and you can read it and it really stirs the audience and calling for action. Okay, so that is now the actual presentation. The commencement, the beginning and the end. Any questions? Yes? Yes. Some, some people who are interested in making presentations, they say uh, that the most uh, thing that remains in the I mean, audience mind, the beginning and the end of the presentation. Absolutely. Uh, so you, you must just concern on these two parts in your presentation. Mm, not only those two parts. No, I mean, you must give more. You must, your beginning and end must be good. Yeah. But where do you normally lose your audience? Not in the beginning and the end. Where do you normally lose them? In the body. You, you lose them in the body. So that is where you need to bring them up. So that's what we're going to be discussing just now. Right? How to keep the attention of your audience all the time. Okay, that brings me to the next point. How do you control questions? Question and answers. When do you take questions? Do you take questions during your presentation? Do you take it at the end? At the Don't take any questions? At the beginning, just like an ice break. No, no, okay. 
But besides that, you can, you can escape from some questions. Sorry? You can escape from some questions by smart uh, lines. Okay. We'll come to that, the tough questions. But should you take questions? Shouldn't you take questions? Or when must you take them? Actually, you have done now escaping. <laughs> no, no, no. Sometimes it's covered later on, then I don't cover it. Yes? When you start, you yeah. start by a short story or you can start by a question? Question because it's a graph. Hmm. Now, this question I'm talking about is questions that the audience have. They want to ask you questions. When do you take those questions? Mm -hmm. Okay? Two questions. When do you tell the audience that it's time for question? Okay, but when do you tell them that? You tell them in the beginning? At the end. At the end. You must tell them. Okay, let's see what you say. Uh, I think one of the reasons to uh, divide is the uh, presentation to parts. Uh, after each part, uh, he must give the chance for the ideas to... Uh, Ask questions? Uh, yes, to raise questions if they have on these parts. Okay, there's lots of hands popping up. I'll just take a last question because we need to move on. Yes? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, during your introduction, after telling them what you want to discuss with them, you can let them know the way you want to take the question. The end. Okay, so that is when you'll tell them about question. Either you'll tell them, I'll take questions as we go along, or I'll take questions at the end. If you've got any questions, write them down. Right? But that's not the best time to take questions. Okay, also, people debate, should they take questions while the person is speaking or keep it to the end, that depends whether you can control the questions. If you can't control the questions, don't take questions during the speech. Because what happens quite often, you might ask a question, I'm not answering it. You might ask the next question leading from that question. I'll answer that, I'll answer that, and then you get lost. The trend of thought is diverted, right? So unless you can control the questioning, then you must do it immediately. Short, crisp answer you can give, do it and move on. Right? But it depends on your, uh, how you can handle it. Ideally, people take it at the end, but we don't suggest at the end. Because what happens at the end? Now you've given the talk. You've built up, you've built up the climax. You've given your punch line at the end, take action. Everyone is on a high. Now questions start. So that brother asks a question. That brother will ask a question and you're answering. That brother will ask a question. Now your question got nothing to do with the presentation. That brother will ask a question leading from his question. So what happens to the presentation? People forget about, about the presentation, and then they're looking at how well you are answering the questions. Right? So you lose your audience, and the whole presentation fizzles away. So when should you take questions? Either take them during the presentation, or public speaking, they tell you, take it towards the three-quarter mark, or the four-fifth mark of your presentation. So if you've got a one-hour presentation, when it's about 50 minutes gone, in and at that point, take questions five minutes or seven minutes or so, then you still got three or four minutes, then you bring them back, build up your climax and give them your parting message. Is that before your conclusion? That's, yeah, that, that, that will be your conclusion. So your, your questions will be a few minutes before your conclusion. Yes. Just before your conclusion. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Yes. Well, it makes sense. Okay. What should you do if someone from the audience causes a disturbance or insults you. Especially when there's debates. And they could be insulting. So what should you do? You then come and you tell that person that you answer some of the questions that you may have after only one and one. So that they, they then improve the questions. That's one way. But what should you do? Anyone else? The difference is we tell him we will answer everything at the end. They will debate the subject like Okay. Maybe you, you, if you raise a question, let them answer it. Mm -hmm. Okay, with some suggestions. Yeah. Yes. We'll be looking at the, at the, at the Sharia. Avoid becoming angry firstly. Okay. Right, because he's going to pick on you. You might say some derogatory things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, he's so going to make you cross, make you angry. So what should you do? Avoid becoming angry. Try to calm down. Relax, smile. These things are difficult, but this is what the Sharia tells us. This is what you need to do. I've come across one of the books where someone was insulting the speaker. <coughs> so what the speaker did was, he asked him, could you, brother, could you please identify yourself for everyone? Give us your name. Now you think he's going to give his name? 
No. Because everyone's now focused on to be on him. Yes. And that's where the Christian ended. Right? So there's, there's different tricks that you can use. Uh, but as you go along, you'll get the experience. Or sometimes the person, he thinks he knows more than you, or he wants the audience to, to, to see that he knows a lot. So when you're speaking, now he's contributing. Again, you speak for a while, he's contributing. So what do you do? Hey brother, uh, I think you know a lot about the subject. Uh, why don't you join me on the stage? <laughs> you think he's going to come on the stage? No. He's not going to come, he's going to be quiet. Sometimes you have to be clever. What if he right? did? Sorry? What if he did? What if he did? <laughs> okay, so then the difficult questions give him. <laughs> no, but he won't. He won't. People are embarrassed. See, there, there he is, no one can see him. Right, he's hiding. But public speaking is, you can't hide in front of everyone. What should you do if you do not know the answer? Should you shoot from the hips and just carry no, no. on? That's when I want to, to be, end yes. the last point. It's, no, it's good. For, yes. for, 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 you can't tell you are more experienced, you are half, mm. more discussion. Can, can we discuss later? I'll give you my email, then I will answer you, your question, otherwise. That's what they are doing it. Yes. Yes. Uh, another, yes. yes. Uh, another way, just to smart way actually, when you, don't, when you don't know the answer, you just tell, uh, if, does anyone of you know the answer? And it gives you time to think about the question again. That's one way as well. Yes. Um, you can't just um, answer the question by not answering it. So if he like, uh, just a really simple, it, it may not make sense now, but if he told you how old are you, you just know how old are you, mm. but so you can say, uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia, just something mm. that, uh, it's just about the same exact question, but it's related to, mm. so uh, people uh, to be confused. And okay, okay so is. what all of you have said is correct. <laughs> what all of you have said is correct. <laughs> His name is Muhammad. No, no, who's Muhammad? You are him. He's Muhammad. What Muhammad? But who is going to make a speech on tomorrow? You. Yeah, no, he's making a speech tomorrow. If you find a politician who will say, okay, if you make a statement, and a very diplomatic way of answering, you say, I don't disagree with you. I don't agree with you. But the answer is like, you can take it whichever way you want. Okay, all of you are right. Right, depending on the circumstances. So, either if you don't know the answer, then tell him that I don't know, I'll get back to you. Give the MC or the organizers your email address and I'll get back to you. That's the one. Uh, one way is you can say, okay, we'll discuss it one on one at the end because I think so it doesn't really concern everyone. So, you can discuss it at the end. And you, very good point you made because that's what Prophet used to also do. So, when questions were asked, not that he did not know the answer. The questions, he used to turn them into questions. You see, either turn them into questions or direct them into another direction. So if you ask him something, uh, for example, uh, when is the last day? And the Kufar used to always try and mock the Prophet and ask when is the last day? So when Man Sahabi asked him that, so he asked, what preparations have you made for the last day? Right, so you put the question to him. Nothing wrong. Right, so you have to be smart. Say I don't know, if you don't know the answer, always speak the truth and never give wrong and uncertain answers. Even Kathir states that whenever a question was asked and Rasulullah did not know the answer, he used to keep quiet. But once he had the answer, he used to call the person who asked the question and give him the answer. So all the answers are there. Okay, as far as your handouts, your notes, when should you give it to the public? When should you give it to the audience? If you are in lectures, if you are in class, when should you give it to the people? Sorry? Beginning of the lesson. At the end. Anyone else? When they're leaving. When they're leaving. When they're leaving. Okay. Yes? If there is detailed information, just give them in the end. If there is just uh, hit points, mm. give them in the beginning. I think on time would be good before when, when you are going to explain. Okay, you wanted to say something? It depends actually. Yes. The presentation mm. uh, sometimes when you are teaching, you give handouts for study, mm. for subject. So 
So you are explaining, you want them just to listen to you and then study. But sometimes you need them to follow you, the, the headlines or something. Okay. The rule is do not give handouts in the beginning. What's going to happen if you give it in the beginning? Then you're going to be flipping through this while I'm speaking. You're going to be looking there, where am I? Sometimes you I'm going to be boring. So now you just want to keep yourself occupied. You're forced to sit here the whole day. So you're just flipping through, right? So don't give it out in the beginning. There is one exception to that. Preferably give it out at the end. Don't give it out during the presentation because if I'm handing something out to you now, while I'm speaking, then you're handing me all the noise that is being made, people are being distracted, I am being distracted. But you give it in the beginning if you're going to be using the notes. So what public speakers do, even I have workshops, say a whole day workshop, uh, then I might have uh, a manual that I'll give. And whilst I am speaking and I have, say, a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam, and I might just leave it three quarter blank, and I might just say, start it, this is what the Prophet Wasallam said, just his first two or three words, You've got a manual in front of you, and then when I click the next slide, the hadith comes up, and you are taking, completing it in your book. Now that's a very good method, especially if you're teaching. Why? Because the audience are not only listening, they are writing, and they are thinking. Isn't that so? Will you say that again? Yes. Because I'm not concerned. Yes, it, it, it's a very good method if you want them to take notes. Right, so if you want them to take notes, and if you've got a sentence here, they just take any sentence, right? The, Pro the Prophet ﷺ has said, uh, according to Ibn Kathir, this is what he said, and I stop here. If you do not know the answer, so in your book, the sentence will be half, if you do not know the answer, and have dots. Now the next slide, when I go on, then I'll give the answer, and now you are completing your notes. So you write the balance of it there. The advantage is you are thinking as uh, the presentation is going on, and you are writing as well. And the Prophet ﷺ encouraged writing. He encouraged the Sahaba to write. When those uh, when he used to receive revelation, he used to call the scribes. He had eight or nine scribes. He used to call them and he used to get them to write. Once there was a Sahabi who came, uh, who used to take down the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he used to take it down. And then when he went to his tribe and they criticized him, he said, but why are you taking everything that the Prophet is uh, giving you? Because some of it might be from his own habits or likes and dislikes. So he stops writing. And then he went to the Prophet He said, I used to write, but this is why I stopped writing. He said, you must continue writing. Because whatever I say is inspiration to Allah. So the Prophet encouraged writing. So even your students, get them to write, but if they're not going to be writing, then don't give them material at the beginning because it will be distracting. Okay. Okay. So this is what we've done. We've discussed so far. Public speaking artistry. Now we're going to be discussing on how to make the presentation. But we'll go very quickly through these parts. So public speaking, the presentation is everything. Presentation is everything. And the first impression is very important. So you can either have that smiling face when you see the people, or you can have that nervous face with that foot. I mean, I discussed in the beginning, first impressions. So when you come in and you are nervous, and then you are like this, you're walking and you look like, either you can have that or have a nice smile on your face when you come in, they think you're confident, they'll be happy also, and then they'll be looking for you to do well. Why show your nervousness? Make a confidence entrance. Dress well for the occasion. You must have that I am happy expression on your face. So when you come in, have a nice smile. What you're telling them is I'm happy that you are here. I am also happy to be here. That sort of a face you must have, right? You enter the lecture venue, you walk confidently to a chair, to the mic, to the podium. We discussed this earlier. In a small group, you'll probably start shaking hands. A small group. Before we start, I'll come to you. Brother, how are you? How's your day? What's your name, etc. Right? Have that eye contact. And this will also assist you in getting over your nervousness. What did Rasulullah Sallallahu say about dress? He regarded dressing well and good, looking good as a demonstration of the blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He said Allah loves to see the result of His blessing on His creatures. Right? 
Once he told the Sahaba, when they were going to travel to meet some other people, you are going to visit your brothers, so repair your saddles, make sure that you are dressed well, so that you will stand out among people like, a, like an adornment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love ugliness. He even admonished the Sahaba who were unkept, disheveled. And there were a few incidents of that nature. Rasulullah once was in a mosque, masjid, when a man with unkept hair, untidy beard came in. He pointed towards him as if indicating that he should tidy up his hair and beard. The man went and did so. Then he returned. Prophet said, is this not better than that any one of you should come with unkept hair? So whether it's your beard, whether it's your hair, Prophet used to apply a lot of oil to his hair, to his beard. He used to comb his beard regularly, according to Aisha. Uh, right. Then we look at the smile. It's been said for the Sahabi, I have, I never saw anyone with a more smiling disposition than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina, Sayyidatuna, Umm al Darda, the wife of uh, Hazrat Darda, states that when my husband smiled during the course of his speech, he always smiled. She once told him that it should not be that people consider you a fool due to the habit. He said, never did I see Rasulullah speaking, except that he would be smiling as well. Abu Huraira reports, now with regard to shaking hands, I told you that when you go meet the brothers, interact with them. So there was this one hadith where Hazrat uh, Abu Huraira who states, that he may say na Uzaifa, and intend, who intended to shake hands, or the Sulla Sala met Uzaifa Dalilanho and intended shaking hands with him. Uzaifa Dalilanho bit held his hand as he needed to perform Ghusan. The Sulla Sala then stated, When two Muslims meet and shake hands, their sins shed away as leaves shed off a tree. Right? right. How did the Prophet Sallallahu walk? I've given you all those examples, but they're all the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and we won't go through them again. He did not shake his shoulders when he walked. He walked in a dignified manner. He walked as if he was descending from a slope. He did not glance about to the right and left while he's walking. Sayyidina Hassan al Anu said that when Rasulullah walked, he lifted his legs with vigor, leaned slightly forward, and placed his feet softly on the ground. He walked at a quick pace and took a rather long step. He did not take small steps. When he walked, it seemed as if he was descending to a lower place. Okay, so that's about making the first impression, which is very important. Now, when we talk of public speaking artistry, we normally use the acronym SEV, or I like to use this, sincerity is for S, enthusiasm and vitality. Now sincerity, we show with our eyes, and we said we're going to be discussing the eye contact, so sincerity we show with our eyes, enthusiasm we show with our facial uh, expressions, and vitality with our arm gestures. So, we express our emotions through our eyes. Whether we are happy or sad, we show it through our eyes. Isn't that so? Even if we are showing love for our parents or, or some of our children, grandchildren, we show it through our eyes. But then the, also there is that phrase that if looks could kill, if looks could kill, meaning that your looks are so bad, it's as if you could kill us. So the same eyes, they could have positive and negative connotations. So. To sway an audience, you have to be watching them when you speak. <coughs> Feel the vibe they are putting out and respond to it. So if this is your audience, part of them are interested, part of them are disinterested, then you need to liven things up. Right? Or if they are like that, then you need to just shut up and leave the stage. Right? Because you're wasting your time, no matter what you say. But you won't know this, and I've seen speakers who are looking out of the window, looking at the ceiling as if all the lighting is on the ceiling, not looking at the audience. I've seen it. And it's very, uh, this is not professional at all. So if you don't pay attention to your audience, you are not going to, they are not going to pay attention to you. So how do you look at your audience? Now, in public speaking, they say you must look at the people 
for two seconds and then move your gaze to another person for two seconds while you speak in two seconds. It's difficult to do, but with practice you can master it, right? But in a big audience, you do what we call the W or the M. So say there's about 100 people in this hall. So when I'm looking, I could start looking from the right front, and as I'm speaking, I look towards the rear, and then I look towards the front, again look towards the rear, and look towards the front. So that's the, the M way of looking. If there's a big audience, you must remember you don't have to look at the audience in the eye, because as far as they are concerned, you are looking at them. So if I'm looking in the direction of the brothers in the back, but I'm not looking at them, I'm looking at that poster in the back. But when I'm looking at the poster in the back, as far as they are concerned, I'm looking at them. Isn't that so? Yeah. I'm not looking at any of you. I'm looking at that poster, that maroon poster in the back. But you get the impression I'm looking at you. So that's what you need to do. Look in the general direction of the people. They will think that you're looking at them. Okay. Eyes of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa while delivering a sermon, it's been narrated that when he delivered his sermon, his eyes often used to become red and his voice rise high. Right? The reason for this was that the words of his sermon emanated from the core of his heart and it was his desire that his words should penetrate deep into the hearts of the audience so that they may understand and act upon the advice given. Right? So we don't only have to keep our tone soft. There are times when we have to raise it and times when we have to lower our uh, voice. He said that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi used to give each of those sitting with him his attention. None of them, none amongst them uh, who were sitting ever thought that the other was being given more attention by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Even when we go to good speakers in a masjid or wherever, and when the Imam of Khatib or Sheikh is sitting and he's talking, we think that he's only talking to us. Isn't that so? We think that he's only talking to us and you'll think the same and you'll think the same. Why? Because he is getting your, your attention by eye contact and also he's speaking from his heart. When you speak from your heart, then the message goes into the heart of the audience. Right, so eye contact is very, very important. Uh, Brother Muhammad, you agree with that? Eye contact is very important? You <laughs> 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 still don't agree? Yeah, sure, sure. Still don't agree? Yeah, yeah. Now you agree, mashallah. Okay, now enthusiasm. So we said SEV, S, sincerity. Sincerity is your eyes. E, enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is from your face, your expressions on your face, right? Now, if you are sorry, but you are laughing and you're saying sorry, or you're smiling and you're saying sorry, are you really sorry? Are you really sorry? You're not. And if you're thanking a person and you're crying and you're thanking a person or you've got a scolding face and you're thanking a person, are you really thanking a person? No. You're not thanking a person, right? So your facial expression is very important when you are speaking. Right. You might not notice, but the others, the audience are noticing. And professional speakers, what I, I read is what they do is actually practice their expressions in the mirror. So if they're smiling, then they'll smile in the mirror. They'll see how they are, how they appear to the audience when they're smiling. Or they are cross. Right? So actually they do it. In fact, actors, actors go for acting classes. And in acting classes they teach you all these different facial expressions. Right, look at the expressions of Sheikh Ahmed Didat, Rahmatullah So he said, enthusiasm is in the face. Can you see enthusiasm there in his face? Huh? You can see it there. The Sunnah Sallallahu spoke with feeling and emotion. It would be, his face would be beaming like the full moon when he was happy. And in various other narrations, I think so we don't have too much time, so let's just skip that. Rasulullah Sallallahu used humor in his uh, presentations. He cried as well in his presentations, right? And Sayyidatina Aisha narrates that when Rasulullah Sallallahu was overcome with anxiety or grief, he would clutch his beard. That's what he used to do. Right, so these are expressions. You show it from your face. So, if there is, if what you are saying is emotional, you must show it. Show the emotion in your own expression as well. Once I was giving a talk somewhere, I was talking to those uh, parents caring for the disabled and those teachers. And what I was talking about was very emotional. And uh, lump came in my throat and I couldn't proceed. Right? So I sat down, I took some water, I drank the water. 
And before I continue, when I looked at the audience, a lot of the audience were wiping the tears, right? Because I was saying something that was touching my heart. I was emotional about it. And that emotion transferred to the audience. So if there's something that's emotional you're saying, then show your emotion. If you're talking about a sad event, someone's father passed away, and you're showing that sadness, you must show it in your expression. Once there was a lady, public speaker, motivational speaker, and her expertise was uh, marriage counseling, how to get parties together, husband and wife, if they're having marital disputes. And she was going to be giving a speech on a certain day. But just before that day, the day before, she went to court and she got a divorce from her husband. Now imagine she's speaking the next day on getting parties together. But she said, fight or fright, what did she do? She didn't run away, she didn't say, I'm cancelling it. She fought it, she went there the next day, now she had to speak about it. Now what, can she speak about being an expert in getting people together when her marriage has broken down? So what did she do? She stood in front of them and she confessed to them what had happened to her. And she told them, I'm supposed to be an expert on this, but it hasn't worked out in my own marriage and I've just gone through a divorce and she started crying. When she started crying, the audience started crying with her. Right? And then when she composed herself, and when she continued, she said that that was the best speech she had given in her life. What? It came from the heart. Right? So the emotion, show the emotion. If you're happy about it, show emotion. It's not a problem. In fact, it is very, very effective. Right, so all that we, we show through our face. Vitality, now vitality is the gestures. Now is this person's gestures showing that he is happy, he is quite glad, etc. When his hands are like this, when he's speaking and his hands are like this, does it show vitality? Who do you think in modern age are regarded by the West as some of the greatest orators of our time, the last 100, 200 years? Who are some of the people? Sorry? Hitler. Hitler. <coughs> Martin Luther King Jr. Anyone else? Sorry? Malcolm X. Mandela. Sorry? <coughs> Mandela wasn't a very good speaker. He wasn't, if you saw him, he wasn't that a speaker. Now we're talking of vitality, gestures and things. He wasn't. He was very Huh? Very quiet. He had his own way. He used to get through to the hearts of the people because what he used to speak was was genuine. Right. Sheikh Ahmed. Sheikh Ahmed Now, previously I, I, I shouldn't include him because I don't know much about him. So the people, these are the slides I used to always use. Now look at Hitler. This is one speech and this are just four uh, clips or four parts of that speech. See the emotion he's putting in in one speech. See that, look at his gestures. So even though his message was nonsensical, he was able to motivate and get people in their millions to follow him, right? Because one is the contents and the other is the presentation. Martin Luther King. The other person was Winston Churchill. Was, he used to spend hours and hours, days on preparation for his speeches. And what he used to say used to move nations. Right. But then when I, as I said, preparing for this, these presentations, so I had to do my own work. I went through a whole lot of CDs of Sheikh Ahmed Dida. There's about 200 CDs here. I just scratched the surface, went through his YouTubes and things. And then I picked up this. Now look at this. Now is that vitality sure. in, his, in his gestures? Can you see it? Will he be convincing the audience or not? Look at this one here. <laughs> Maybe he was upset about something and you know. Hmm? Right. Look at that one there. Okay, what did Rasulullah do with his hands and arms when delivering sermons? Okay, we've discussed this. Sometimes he pointed his fingers or hands, sometimes he raised two fingers together, sometimes he interlocked his fingers, sometimes he pointed towards the sky, sometimes he held his tongue. Very effective. Sometimes he covered his mouth as a hadith about on the day of Qiyamah when the people are going to be drowning in their sweat. And when he was explaining that, then he covered his mouth right up to this stage. 
Right. And sometimes he spread out his entire hand. So look at the hadith. Go back. Look at the hadith of the Prophet. So now you must read it with a different mindset when you're reading it now. Because all these things I'm telling you, all these things you know. You've read it a number of times, but it's not in this context. So now when you read it, now you must be looking at it with different eyes. Even as what I'm telling you about public speaking, now when you are looking at people speaking, isn't that so from the time I started my lectures on Monday, everyone else who's come after that, you've been observing them, isn't it? Yes, we did. Right? Yes, we did. You're observing them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Are they doing what uh, Mohammed Bayer has said? Are they doing things better than that? Is there improvement in how they are presenting themselves? Yes, so See, so this is what you want to do when you go back. Even in school, in, in universities, wherever you are, when people are speaking, automatically now in your mind, you are already going to be doing, which is very good for you. Right? And if it's your friends, or if it's people who are, who are not averse to improving themselves, then just go up to them and tell them, you know what? Is there, can I tell you how you could improve your presentation? Or when you make your presentation and he's there, you must ask him, is there anything that I'm doing wrong? Can you identify it? Right? Okay, we, we won't go through all this. Now let's move on to grabbing the attention of the, during the presentation, right? So I was just going through some uh, clips, uh, amusing things. I came across this as one person is saying, I was floating in a tunnel towards a very bright light. And then a voice told me I had to go back and finish listening to the presentation. So the person was sleeping, presentation is carrying on, and someone told me, go back and listen. Right. And how often that happens? It happens. Right. And then this man was talked to death. And this happens. And we might be guilty of it. We might be speaking there, we might be putting people to sleep. And yet on the other hand, look at the school teacher, look at how attentive these people are. She's grabbed their attention. And the person who was an expert on and this was Steve Jobs. Whenever he made his presentation, simple, the screen, he just had his iPad or whatever he was demonstrating, he wore black and everything was bare. And yet how he was able to grab the attention. See, this is now the delivery part. So identify the areas where the concentration would left. So what you need to do, You've got your presentation, you've written it out. Now you must have a look at it. This part here, it will be interesting to the audience. This part here, I think they'll be sleeping. So you need to add things to liven things up. Right, and that's what we're going to be discussing. So, in your presentation, as well as stated, concentration is highest at the beginning and at the end. And this is where you lose them. And you have to make a concerted effort, effort, uh, attempt to get them back. Sorry, brother, you had your hand up previously. Gee, I asked you before, uh, somebody asked you a personal question and it's a serious question mm. and it's an honest question. How do you answer that? Is personal you... question? Yes. He is personal question. No, he asked you a question yeah. about yourself. About yourself. You can say I can answer it later. You can do that. If, if there's a lesson to be learned by people, if there's a lesson to be learned by people, then there's no reason why, why you can't why answer it. Right? Yes. But if it is too personal, then you can tell him we can discuss it yeah. separately or privately. And this is why it, it, it had exactly the same connotation. One is I could have told him, uh, yes, I could have answered it, but it actually had a very broad, broad aspect. Yeah. So if it would have benefited the people, there's no reason why you can't answer it. And actually 60% of people won't ask you again. They will forget. Mm. So mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Things to do for dramatic effect, ask questions, create pictures in the minds of the audience, and all this I'll give you examples, inshallah, from the life of the Prophet Use pictures and comparisons to make your statistics numbers meaningful. Use a visual aid. This is a visual aid. Props. Use things that are there that you can give examples with. Be more spontaneous and introduce real life situations. Have I been introducing real life situations? Did I give you examples from my own life? Right. So when you give examples from your own life, you become more human to your audience. And they accept you more. Right, so if there's something that's relevant, you can tell them. Use analogy, have more activities. So you see people are now going to sleep. Then they get you up the last two times, stand up, massage each other, take deep breaths, do things. Right. Take regular breaks. What did Rasulullah some do? He paused. If you look at the hadith of the Prophet there was one hadith of the Prophet You can read it in your own time. I think so it was last in Jabal. 
you know, if you were sitting on the horse, Rasulullah was sitting in front and he was sitting behind him on the same camel, and then he called Maas and Jabba, said, Ya Maas, and then he answered, uh, Yes, Rasulullah, I'm here at your service. Prophet did not say anything. Continued after a while, called his name again, again said, I'm at your service, didn't say anything. Third time he called his name, again Prophet said, I'm at your service, Prophet didn't say anything. Thereafter, he said, now, he told him what, what he had to tell him, that even if you just take Naila in the line, you go to heaven. Right? So, that's an example of a pause. <laughs> now imagine if you are Maas bin Jabal, and you're sitting behind the Prophet Sallallahu and he's calling your name, and you say, here I am at your service, and he doesn't say anything. And the second time, and the third time. See how powerful pauses could be to get the attention of the audience. Public speakers do it all the time. Right? He spoke with vibrancy. Excuse me? Yes. The Prophet didn't answer Mu'adi the same day? No, no. He answered, but not the same time. Uh -huh. So after asking the three times, mm -hmm. and then as they continued, then he said, Mas, what I want to tell you is this. Then he told him what he wanted to tell you. Right? Just to prepare him mentally. Just preparing him mentally. Correct. Mm -hmm. He spoke with emotion. Change his posture and position when speaking. There were times when Prophet was speaking to the Sahaba, he was sitting down and he was leaning against something. But then he would sit forward. When he sat forward, immediately gave the impression to the listeners there's something important he wanted to say. Right? He used exhibits and visual props. He used comparisons and similes. He used drawings in the sand. He narrated stories and anecdotes of past peoples. He used humor. Now, isn't all these ways to grab attention? Yes. And all these ways are mentioned here in this book when I was doing my research from the West. Everything is there. And there's even more if you look at the life of Prophet And there's more examples and more relevant examples. <coughs> Prophet raised his voice once he was delivering a lecture in a, in a high pitch that even the young ladies sitting in seclusion in the inner rooms of their homes could hear him when he was speaking in Masjid Nabawi. Right, so sometimes it is necessary for you to raise your voice. Anger of the Prophet when he became angry, his face became flushed, red. It was as if pomegranate seeds were burst on his face, as if like just flushed with red, redness. Using props, things. So Prophet was telling the Sahaba about what they can use and what they can't use. So a man can't use silk and he can't use gold. Prophet Sallallahu then raised a piece of gold, he raised a piece of silk and he said, you can't use this. But the woman in our community, in our Ummah can use it. So he was using the props, picking it up, it makes more sense to the people. It will stay there in their minds. Spoils of war, once Prophet Sallallahu was telling the Sahaba of how serious it is, what a big sin it is to steal from the war booty, the spoils of war. Right? And then he was standing there after a battle and the, the war booty was there and he picked up items. He said, if you take this without permission, then this is the consequences. So he was using it. So even you in your talks, don't just stand there and feel that you, know, you, you shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing it. Okay, this is a famous hadith of, that was narrated by Salman al-Farsi. You know the one the way he shook the tree. And when he shook the tree, the leaves were falling. And then he asked, uh, aren't you asking me why I'm shaking the tree? Then he said that Rasulullah once, when I was present, he shook the tree. And then the leaves fell. And then what did he say? Indeed, if a Muslim performs that excellent wudu, and then performs five compulsory salah, his sins shed away just as these leaves have fallen from this branch. Props. Use the props. Right. Okay, then there's this incident about the tree. Analogies, a number of analogies you'll see that the Prophet used. Once that lady came to the Prophet and said, Now, my mother passed away, but she hasn't gone for Hajj, so can I go on her behalf? And what the Prophet then asked, Would you, if your mother had any debts, would you pay them on her behalf? Yes, I would. The debt owed to Allah is more worthy of being fulfilled and paid off. Right, so analogy. Right, so go back, read these hadith now with the new eyes. And there's a number of examples. Using pictures and drawings. Famous hadith of the Prophet 
there in the sand. He drew, he drew that square, and then that line that went out, and then he was telling the Sahaba, and then all these other lines here. And then he was telling that Sahabi, this is the human being. This is the square. This is his life, which encircles him from all sides. This is the one that goes out. This, these are his hopes, and this is his life. And these are all the calamities of his life. So he was using these things. We must use them. Right? And then he practically demonstrated. So even if you're talking and you practically demonstrate, we don't have time, but I could have called Muhammad and said, okay, Muhammad, you sit there and I'll sit here and I'll practically demonstrate something that I'm doing. When we have this workshop two whole days, then we have time with the people, so then we call. If I'm talking about lowering your voice, then I'll give you an example. I say that, Muhammad, now the same sentence, now lower your voice and say, raise your voice and say. So you, you must do that also, depending on the time that you have. Right? So the Prophet practically demonstrated it. Practically demonstrated wuzu. Once there was a young boy, and he was skinning some sheep, uh, skinning sheep. And the Prophet Sallallahu walked past, and he went to that youngster, and then he also got down and started skinning the sheep. And he took his hand and put it between the skin and the flesh until it went right up to the pit of the arm. And he said, this is how you must skin the sheep. Showing physically. Now imagine you think that boy will ever forget. Yeah. Don't forget. So if you get a chance to physically demonstrate when you are presenting, do it. Sheikh Ahmed did that. I saw one of his slips uh, that one of the best, uh, most publicized uh, debate of his in America. So there, he was telling that, Gilchrist, I think his name was, and he was telling him that if you read this verse, verse number so and so in your Bible, I will give you $100. <laughs> I dare you to read it. And he took $100 from his pocket, he said, I'll give it to you. Yeah, because that, that verse had something derogatory to say about the prophets and he was trying to prove that it can't be a word of God if there's such derogatory things mentioned in the Bible mm -hmm. right but then he took up the, the challenge he read it and Ahmad Dira then gave him the hundred dollars and he took the hundred dollars and he gave it back to Sheikh Dira and he said okay you had hired this wall use it for the hire for the payment of the fees but that's an example so do things like that now it will have a tremendous effect on your audience Body language, the effect of body language is 55% of your speech. The words that you use has only 7% effect. And the tone of voice is 38%. So if I'm speaking to you and my body language is not saying anything, my voice, is that the tone is just at one monotone le level, then the effect it will have on you is only 7%. But if I raise my voice, lower my voice, etc., put emotion in my voice, 38 percent effect, and the body language, walking, interacting with people, gestures, that's the effect it has. Okay. How should we stand? I think we can conclude on this. What's, what's a confidence posture? That's a confidence posture, not this here. Stand with the back straight, shoulders back and even, head straight and even chin slightly up, chest upright, slightly raised, body must be more or less firm if you are going to be standing, tight, weight evenly balanced, arms in neutral position, the arms, not the hands, the arms, right? Legs apart, feet flat, about the shoulder width apart, so just a, like how we stand when we are in Salah, so that way, right? Bare posture, slumping forward, slouching, putting your head down, looking at the ceiling, jiggling your legs, keep you slightly like, ladies normally stand like this, when they talk, <laughs> ladies talk like this, just <laughs> public speakers, <laughs> right, hands behind the back, crossed, etc. So, you know, where should your hands ideally be? We'll conclude on this. When you are standing, where should your hands ideally be? Your hands, not your arms, your hands. Where should your hands be? What should Sorry. you be doing with your hands? You, you use them or to be... Uh, Keep them on your side or... Use them. Sorry? Use them. Use them, gestures. If you're not gesturing, then what should you do? Like Keep them in front here. Yes. Just in front. Touching your body away from your body? Oh. Away from your body. I think, I think showing the palms is a very opening way to... Okay, so that's, that's for gestures. So if you show your palms, gestures also have meaning. You show your palms like this, you're very transparent, very open very warm 
And if you do show your palms in other ways, it have negative con connotation as well. But that we don't have time for. Okay, what shouldn't you do with your hands? Oh. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. All right. So as the brother pointed out, this is the natural way. So either you can have your hands on the side, or like when we make salah, you know, when you make salah, right? Like if your hands is like this, slightly away from your body, that's fine. That's a natural place to keep your hands. Okay. I think we'll. Yes. <coughs> What if you um, did like about everything correct? Like you have a really good speech, you're um, setting confidence, um, you're uh, changing your voice, and then in the middle you're trying to activate the people, the audience, and you're just um, saying a joke, and then you laugh, and you look at the audience and no one laughs. Like <laughs> you're the only one who's laughing, what should you do? <laughs> then you hope you hope the floor opens up and you fall. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do humor. Inshallah, you see, the time is time is a bit of a problem. But one of the things we're going to be discussing is humor. What do you do when people don't laugh? Just carry on. Just carry on. Just ignore it and carry on as if nothing happened. So therefore, with humor, you must never announce humor. Don't say I'm going to give you a joke because now <laughs> you deep, they are expecting a joke from you. And if they don't laugh, then what happens? Right, so if you say something humorous, why are you saying talking, talking, say something humorous and carry on? Even if they don't laugh, it's not serious. Right, but we can discuss that each other next time. I mean, not everyone has the sense of humor, so... Yes. If you don't have the sense of humor, don't say humor. Humor is a very, very powerful tool, tool to liven up the situation, especially when the people are going to sleep. And there's ways of doing it. And each other, when we meet the next time, we'll talk about that. Humor. Very, very powerful. Humor is very powerful. Okay, are we? Okay. No more questions? So if we take a break now, inshallah, we'll meet tomorrow. Thank you. I always like to add my five minutes uh, in the session over here. But some of the points that he uh, had to raise on posture. Now, if you remember the Prophet, وسلم, when they performed the first Hajj after the Treaty of Arabia, one of the instructions that he gave to the Sahaba is that. When you are making your tawaf, act like you are brave soldiers. Mm -hmm. And even in Ramadan, that this is a posturing because just by your this thing over there, imagine if that whole congregation of those Muslims were like weaklings. They would have been at a disadvantage and possibly attacked. But instead, Prophet says, look, act like you are a strong kind of person. Even in public speaking too, we need to actually do that because it has a very powerful impact on the audience, which we probably don't even realize uh, it, uh, it is happening. And, uh, and, and this, even in, in, in organizations do I notice that sometimes, or, or generally we have this habit that look, you know, let's be very polite and humble and shy about things. And we don't advertise even our good works. It's a different thing if you're giving charity and now you're making a big story about it, I gave so much in charity, and that may be pride. But when it comes to public organizations, if you are doing some good, we need to announce it and promote it. Because you don't know, somebody else may be encouraged by the same action kind of a It brings confidence into, uh, into the people that are out there. And uh, somebody raised a question about difficult questions. How do you deal it? This is where your wits and your, you need to be smart. And I give you one example. There were two little boys, and in their village, there was a wise man who always used to answer the questions in a very wise way. So they said, look, let's play a trick on him. What we will do is take a bird, a sparrow, and what we will go to the wise man, we'll put the bird behind our hand, and we will ask him the question, is the bird dead or alive? And if he says it's alive, then we will squeeze the bird and say, we caught you, he's dead. Okay, and if he says he's dead, then we will show you the live bird. So they caught the bird and they went to the wise man. Put the bird behind him and asked him, what do we have in our hands? He says, I think you've got a bird in your hand. Then the next question they asked him, is it dead or alive? So he said the answer to that question lies entirely in your hands. <laughs> okay, now you break for tea. So we had to do, Shoaib is blind and he is a Hafez of the Quran. Uh, he will do a recitation uh, from the Quran for us. Okay. <laughs>
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ بوأنا لإبراهيم مكان البنت ألا تشرك من شيئا وطهر بنت للطائفين وطهر بنت للطائفين والقائمين والركع السجود وأذن في الناس من حج يأتوك رجالا وعلى كل ضامر يأتين من كل فج عميق ليشهدوا منافع لهم ويذكروا اسم الله في أيام معلومات على ما وزقهم من بهيمة الأنعام فكلوا منها وأطعموا الباعس البخير ثم ليقضوا تفتهم وليوفوا نورهم وليطوفوا بالبنت العتيق ذلك ومن يعظم حرمات الله فهو خير له عند ربه وأحلت لكم الأنعام إلا ما يتلى عليكم فاجتنبوا الرجس من الأوثان واجتنبوا قول الزور عنفاء لله غير مشركين به ومن يشرك بالله فكأنما خر من السماء فتخفقه الطير فتخطفه الطير أو تهوي به الريح في مكان سحيق ذلك ومن يعظم شعائر الله فإنها تقوى القلوب لكم فيها منافع إلى أجل مسمى ثم محلها إلى البيت العتيق. جزاك الله بارك الله. Thank you, brother Hafiz Shuey, for that recitation. We are at present over here, the guests of the Region Business School, and we have brother Ridwan Aswad, who is one of the managers of directors in this uh, institution. Uh, before we get into our IPCI program, I'd like to call Ridwan to say a few words, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think firstly I must say welcome to each and every one of you. I think uh, on behalf of Region Business School, we are very pleased and proud to have you here today. Uh, I know there are many uh, guests from various parts of the world. We've got Saudi, we've got uh, what's here? Thailand, Jordan, we've got South Africa, we've got various other countries as well. We are pleased to have you here and it's very interesting because as a business school, we are in many of your countries already. We have students there uh, where we're offering our MBA programs and a whole lot of programs. So we are encouraged to see you here. I'm personally encouraged to see the, the young people here. Uh, not to say I'm very old, but I mean like the younger people. Uh, who have come from these countries. It's actually, I think for me personally, it's a, it's a very encouraging sign of the future of Islam, of the future that we as Muslims throughout the Ummah have, that we have young people that we can garner together, bring from around the world to South Africa to train on various aspects. We're hoping that you enjoy your stay with us here as Regent. We want to say to IPCI, thank you for the opportunity to host you. Please use the facilities as a learning institution, we encourage you to use the facilities, use our academics. Advocate Vaidi is going to be here. You'll meet some of the other uh, people that will be presenting to you. They work, they do a lot of interesting things. We want you to take the best that you can back to your countries, take the best to your organizations, take the best that you can take to other institutions as well. And don't forget, I mean, learning doesn't stop here. I think. There's enough Quranic ayahs, there's enough hadith that talks about learning. 
Uh, and this is actually, Mahmoud, if you allow me, I was very encouraged because I attended a program last year in, in Medina, the MILE program. I don't know if you guys uh, know of it. Uh, it was in Medina. It was a very interesting program. We learned a lot from there on leadership, on the hour, and a whole lot of aspects that we brought to South Africa as well. Please feel free, consider this your home for the next few hours, and let us engage, let us have some good debates, and we, enjoy, we hope you enjoy yourself. There is a whole lot of things that are gonna happen. If there's anything you need, please feel free to ask, and we'll be your host, and we'll look after you, inshallah. Shukran. Shukran, brother Asfad, for those kind words. Uh, now we move straight into our program. At 9.30 to 10.40, we will have Advocate Mohammed Vaid will conclude his sessions. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brothers, we're going to be continuing from where we left off yesterday. And we're going to be rounding up on uh, public speaking from an Islamic perspective. It will probably take us about 20 minutes. And then we've got another half an hour to go on to leadership and management. There's not much time, but we'll try and make the best of the time that we have. And having seen this uh, video, the first who is a chef? What do you think about that presentation of his, the speech of his? What's your first comments regarding it? It's <laughs> very, very interesting because as we can see, we combine the, uh, the emotion with the gestures and the, all that combination. Uh, the, the, the more he introduced, he started from the lower level of the emotions and he raised it as he continued the speaking and all this made some impact. Excellent. Yes. What else? What's your observations of that from a public speaking perspective? Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, in my opinion, he approached people with the subject so much. He, in fact, as my big say, that uh, you want people to feel what they are going to say, uh, make them protect, listen. Mm. It was very emotional. Right? Anyone else shaking? He basically captured the heart, mind, and soul in this entire yeah. speech. Yeah, they're actually involved, we noticed they're actually in crime. They understood what he was saying, so they're involved in this entire speech. Correct. Any other comment from a public speaking perspective? Anyone else? Yes. He used his hands. He used his gestures, yes, his hands, correct? Thank you. was just saying about the same. He was using a good body language. Good body language, okay. <coughs> yes, anything else? Yes, <coughs> right, so the eye contact, he was looking at the audience all the time. Yes, anything else you observe? I think the point that the brother made in the beginning, he started off quite calm. His voice was low. And as he continued, he pulled up his voice as if he was going to a climax. And then as you spoke, you saw firstly his voice was being raised, his gestures increased as well. In the beginning, his hands were just at the bottom. His gestures increased as well. And then depending on the contents, when he said, Ashhadu Allah, ilaha illallah, you saw the emotion, and the people in Medina were all crying, and we listening as if we were part of that uh, audience. Isn't that so? Yeah. Right, so that is a very, very good indication of how a public speech should be. It had most of the things that we had discussed in the past few days. So, we just continue and then we will again reflect. We will again reflect on using his volume. Right, another thing that you need to do in public speaking is to try and introduce, again you must remember we're talking about during the time when you're losing your audience. The attention is the highest in the beginning and at the end. So when you're losing them, that is when you need to do all these things. So one of the things, again, is to show video clips. Right, so during your presentation, provided that it is uh, handled properly, so you can make your, say whatever you want to say, 
stop for a couple of seconds, play a very, very interesting video clip. It raises everyone's attention and you can continue. Right, now let's look at the importance of humor and wit. How important is it to have humor in your speeches? Very important. Why is it important? Yes, sir. Because they get involved and it's actually, it, uh, it relaxes the entire mood. Okay, it relaxes the audience, correct? What are the other advantages of humor? Yes, sir. Correct, it refreshes their mind and brings them to focus, yes, brother? Sorry? You can bring their hearts also by introducing humor. Keep your audience focused. What else? It helps to remember the subject. It helps to remember the subject, yes. And it also wakes them up. Isn't it so? It wakes them up. And there is nothing better than to having a room full of people laughing at your good humor. And it actually encourages the speaker. So it has been said that once you get people laughing, they are listening and you can tell them almost anything. And when you crack a good joke once, they're waiting for the next one and the next one. But what's very important, there's a few things to remember. Some things you must not do when it comes to humor. Firstly, don't announce humor in advance. Don't say that I'm going to tell you a nice joke. Why not? What if they don't laugh? Right? Okay, that's one. What else? Sometimes uh, it may be intended that something is so as as thought by the speaker, but unfortunately, it really not a joke. Okay. So, firstly, you never announce humor in in advance. Don't tell them that I'm going to tell you something very funny. Secondly, when it comes to humor, there are certain topics you don't touch at all. You don't touch politics, you don't touch uh, religion, you don't touch uh, disability, people who might be disabled, don't joke about those things. So there's three or four things that you don't talk about at all unless you are one of those people. So if you're a politician and you're laughing at politicians, it's a different story. But if we are not politicians, we don't do it. Okay. The other thing you must remember is the best humor is what's called self-deprecating humor. What's self-deprecating humor, anyone? Self-deprecating. Self-deprecating humor is where you laugh at yourself. That's the best type of humor. Okay. I'll ask you in a moment why. See, I've got four sons, and you know boys, especially when they're teenagers, they go out with their friends when they're at school and they're at university, they go out with their friends in the night, and you tell them to come early, and sometimes they don't come early, and you tell them the next time, please make sure you're here on time, and again they don't come early, and eventually you tell them, eventually I told my son, one of them, that okay, the next time you go, take your clothes and go and stay at your friend's house. Right, so he didn't say anything. So the next time when he was going out, and you know what they normally do, especially we who got uh, teenage sons, what they normally do is when the car is waiting outside, it's hooting, they've got their jacket over their shoulder, and then they come and not ask you, tell you, can I go? Right, that's what normally happens with teenagers. Okay, so my son then said, okay, I'm going, my car is outside. But I told him, but now you're going to be taking your clothes with you. And uh, he didn't say anything, so I quickly went into the room and I grabbed hold of clothes and I ran behind him and he was already outside and I threw the clothes behind him on the floor outside, on the ground. And he just turned around, looked at it and no reaction on his face at all. Then I went to the room again, got hold of the drawer, his socks, underwear and all the other things and ran behind him and threw that as well. Again, he just looked and he just niggled and he carried on walking. Then my other son came from the back and he said, Papa, Papa, those are my clothes. <laughs> right, and you can imagine how embarrassed I felt. I threw the wrong son's clothes outside. And guess who had to pick them up? Guess who had to pick them up? Exactly. Now, 
that's an example of self-deprecating humor. You're laughing at yourself. It's very difficult to laugh at yourself. It's easy to make jokes about other people, but very difficult to make jokes about yourself. Right, but if you can have self-deprecating humor, it actually makes you human as far as the audience is concerned. Now, you're not a day as a speaker and they are somewhere else, and they relate to you better as well. So that's important. Right, the other thing that we need to do also when it comes to getting the attention when, they, when it's lagging is to use visual aids. So any type of visual aids that relevant, you can use the visual aids. And research has shown that retention, how much the audience retains in their mind from your speech is only 10%. From visual aids, like I'm using visual aids now, from visual aids is 60%. And if a handout is given to them, and if they read the contents of the handout within the next week or two, then they will, re they will retain 85% of your speech. So that shows how important it is to try and use aids as far as possible. Whatever types of aids you might be using. But one simple rule about AIDS is less is more. The less slides you use, the less words you use on the slides, the better. Right, another thing to, that you need to remember, especially when your audience's attention is slagging, is you need to have command of your environment. Now me as a public speaker, if I'm speaking from here, what would you say is my environment? I must command my environment. So what would you say is my environment? The audience. Sorry? The stage. The stage. If I'm standing on a stage, the entire stage is my environment. Okay, so here there's no stage, so the entire front is my environment. What about the rest of the venue? Is that also my environment as a speaker? Yes. It is. Right. I went to a presentation a few years back by a person by the name of... Uh, his first name was Tom, and there was a hall full of about 5,000 executives, managers, executives. He made a presentation for the entire day. He had a stage, but he only sat on a couch on the stage for one hour when there was an interview. The rest of the day, he was walking around the hall, walking in front, walking in the aisles. Now you can see, there's two photographs of him right amongst the people, amongst the audience. Now when he comes right there amongst the audience and he addresses them, it is as if he's speaking directly to them. Isn't that so? If I was just standing there, those people in the back would think that they left out of it. So if you can walk and get closer to your audience, the better. Sometimes you might have a problem is, if I walk here, they won't be able to see me from the back. But then, in his case, there were huge uh, screens on both sides. So even though he went to the back, the people in front were able to see the screen. So that's important. You must try and command your environment. And there is what's called vignettes. Vignettes really means that you must stand in one spot and make one point. After you've made that one point, then you can go to another spot and make another point. I can't walk too far because of this uh, disturbance, but you can walk different places, make one point, and then move on. That's an excellent way of presenting. Some people, they keep on walking up and down. That's not recommended. Because if I'm walking from one end to the other, the audience now, the attention is moving from one end to the other. That's not how it's supposed to be. What do you call that one? V-I-G-N-E-T-T-E-S, big nets. That's, in public speaking, that's the phrase or the word they use. Okay, now let's look, this is the last section, things to be wary of. In public speaking, things that you must be very careful of not falling into a trap. So, one is avoid barriers. What's a barrier? For a public speaker, what's a barrier? Yes, brother? Yeah. Something that is like hijab. Okay, something is like hijab, something that's between you and the audience. Is there any barrier between me and you? No. There's no barrier. Now, is there any barrier between me and you? Somehow. Yeah. There is a barrier. Yeah. This is a barrier. If there's a table, 
and I'm sitting and delivering the speech, then there's a barrier. As public speakers, make sure there's no barrier between you and your audience. Because then it creates a distance if there is a barrier. Right. So you'll notice from the first day I did presentations, did I ever use a podium? Did I use a podium? Did I stand behind a podium? No, no. I didn't. From the first day, I put the podium aside and I had my laptop on a small desk in front of me. Why is it necessary? Why did I have the laptop on the desk in front of me? Uh, to see the next slide. Correct. So then, yes, brother, you have your hand up? No. Oh, just see what's Okay. So the advantage is I am looking at you, even though the information that's here and that's on the slide is in front of me, I am looking at you. I'm not always turning and looking there and again speaking to you and turning. So the advantage of having your laptop in front of you is that you can be connecting with your audience, that eye contact is there all the time. The question then arises, why should you not use podium? or a lectern, why shouldn't you use it? Because some of the our body language will be hidden. Correct, it's difficult to use your full body language if you are standing behind a podium. Secondly, will the audience be able to see your entire body? No. Yes. They won't be able to see your entire body. So there's definite disadvantages. Sometimes it's necessary to use a podium. Sometimes if you've got a whole speech and you have to read out the speech, which is not very good also to read out speeches, but if you've got an entire speech to read out, and you have to be accurate, for instance, politicians, they have to be very accurate with whatever they're saying, because it goes into the newspaper every word. So sometimes it's necessary to have a podium. But if you have to use a podium for purposes of your notes, leave the podium on your side or a table on your side. Don't stand behind it. You saw those uh, clips I showed you of Chef Dinat? There was a table, but it was on his side. All the Quran and the Bibles and things were there, so he had to refer to it, so it was there, but there was no barrier between him and the audience. audience. Next question. Should you sit or should you stand when you deliver your speech? Stand. Sorry, I can't come too far there because of the disturbance. I'm just standing here. Should you stand or should you sit? Stand. 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 It's easier to show people you sit. Correct. If you stand, the advantage is the people can see you. If you're sitting, Difficult. What else? Walking. Walking around. Yes. Okay, but what's, what's the other disadvantages of sitting? Firstly, it's difficult for the people to see you. Secondly, what about your voice projection? And you, your voice as well as you cannot see them all together. You might not be able to see them all. Also, your breathing is affected. If I'm standing, it's easier for me to breathe deeply than if I'm sitting. What about the gestures? Yeah, if I'm sitting, yeah. There'll be limited gestures. Yes. Although the Sheikh did a very good job. Although he was sitting, his gestures you could see, right? But he used it very well. But if he was standing, the gestures could have been even more. The, the, the Sheikh was, he's a little bit up. Right? He was up so people could see him. See him. And that was an advantage. Yeah. Sometimes it's necessary to sit. Person is old, he might be sick, etc. In our country, the habit, the thing that people normally do, no matter how old or how young they are, they all sit. Majority of them sit, my experience. And if you ask them why, they don't know why. Because their seniors are sitting, so they're also sitting. Right, so if it's necessary to sit, you must sit. But otherwise, it's better to stand. Did the Prophet Sallallahu sit or stand? What do you think? Both. Both? Mm. So he stood on the member. He stood amongst the Sahaba. And he sat as well. That is correct. There was a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Once a Sahabi came to him, Sayyidina Abu Rifa al Adawi, he came and the Rasulullah was delivering a sermon. And he came to him. I'm going to turn on because otherwise I'll be blocking. Normally, my laptop will be on the side, not in front of the screen. Right. While he was delivering the speech, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I am a stranger who has come to find out about his religion. I do not know anything about my religion. Prophet Sallallahu then turned towards me, stopped his speech and came to me. A chair was brought to him which I think had legs made of steel. Prophet Sallallahu sat on that chair and began teaching me of that which Allah SWT had taught him. 
He then went back to his speech and completed it. Right, so this is a very good example where he was standing, he came down, sat amongst the Sahaba with that Sahabi in front of him, explained whatever had to be explained, the reason why he did it, and said that if this, this person might have been out of town, this might be the only opportunity he had for me to explain Islam to him. So therefore the Prophet ﷺ interrupted his speech, came down, answered his questions, and then returned. So this shows that you can both stand and sit. Okay. Another thing that we have to be careful about is using non-words. What are some of the non-words? The crutch words. Uh, yes, okay, is that so? Have you heard people using that in their speeches? Sure. Right. And how is it? Interesting or is it disturbing? Distracting. Very distracting. Very, very distracting. But you won't know whether you're using those words or not unless someone points it out to you. Yeah, that's true. Right? So what do you do? If you're giving a speech, one of the things to do in order to, de to establish whether you're using these known words is to tape your speech. If you have to make a speech, you've got it ready, tape it. And then when you listen to it, then you'll realize whether you're using known words or not. Or ask someone to uh, inform you about it. There was once I had gone to a uh, Jummah khutbah, there's one area that I used to go to, and I used to go to that particular mosque for a while, and there was a khatib there who was in the habit of using a particular non-word. And in the 20 or 25 minutes duration of his khutbah, I on occasion he used it about 38 times. 38 times using that one word. Now, what do you think? I was concentrating on his speech or was I concentrating on his non-words? Onwards, absolutely. So that's what happens. If you're not aware of it, it could be very distracting to the audience. Then one day I decided, let me bring it to his attention. So I called him aside and said, Chef, you don't mind if I tell you something? He said, no, no, no not a problem. What is it, brother? And I told him, this is what I observe. He said, no, thank you very much. Two or three weeks later, when I went to the same masjid, same imam was giving a talk, and he used that word no more than about five or six times. Mm -hmm. Right. So unless you know about it, you won't change, or it'll be difficult to change. All right, let's move on. What to do before the day of the presentation, on the day before the presentation, and after the presentation. So the first thing, things to do before the day of the presentation. You have to practice, practice, practice all the time. And as the saying goes, fail to prepare, and you are preparing to fail. And that's a fact. And that's why lots of us are nervous, because we're not prepared enough. So, do whatever it takes to prepare. Even if there's a mirror, I told you that's, and a full length mirror is the best. Don't worry about other people, go into a secluded room and practice your speech. The more you practice your speech, the more in front of a mirror, the more you'll see what you're doing right or wrong. And Sheikh Ahmed did that, used to do that. Because in his biography, his wife states, that he used to practice his speeches in the house aloud and I used to actually tell him what is wrong with you why are you making such a din why are you making such a noise see so to reach that level of expertise in presentations you have to do the hard work okay so you, and you need to role play the day step by step so if you're going to go and give a speech you're at home role play what is to happen so you know you're going to a particular venue you're going to take your laptop or you're going to use their laptop. You must make sure you go there early. Have you got your extension cord or the power plug? If you're going to be using gadgets like this, pointers, etc., have you taken it with you? Have you got the batteries? Have you tested it? Is it working? Is it not working? So, in your mind, you must play back exactly what you think will be happening at the venue. Plan and prepare what to say and how you say it. Rasulullah also encouraged us once. He placed his hand on Sayyidina Abu Dhar's Rayyan's chest and said, Oh Abu Dhar, there is no intelligence like astute planning, no piety like abstinence, and no family pride as excellent as good character. So he was telling him, planning, how important planning is. That in the fact other hadith of the Prophet on that as well. Next thing, things to do on the day of the speech. Set up the room in advance. Make sure you go to the venue early. You don't know what to expect. Right, make sure everything is as you want it. I have to come make sure that the small table is here. 
tell the organizers I won't be using the podium until they can use it afterwards. What about the mic and a host of other things? Walk to the back of the venue. See whether there's any uh, obstruction between the audience and you. It might happen that there might be pillars in the venue and the chairs are behind the pillars as well. Then you need to tell the organizers, move those chairs. But you won't know all these things until you get there. Once a person went to make a presentation to a very, very big venue, and because he went there late, he did, he did not realize that the spot where he spoke from was in the center of the venue. So there were people sitting right around him, and this happens in big venues overseas. America, you get that. You got five, 10,000 people in a venue, and the stage might be in the center. So your presentation will be different than if you are standing in front. But you won't know these things until you go to the venue. If you can go to the venue before the day of the presentation, all the better. Right, what else can you do? Set up the room in advance. Know in advance what type of microphone you'll be using. That's very important. Now just for your benefit, there's four types of microphones. One is the lapel one, the one that I use at IPCI. The other one is the head one, which I also use at IPCI. The third one is this one I'm holding now, uh, without any cord. And the fourth one is the mic. It has a cord and it's normally on a stand. These are the four types of mics. Which is the best? I think the one close to your eye. Okay, the one around your head, around your ear. And which other one? The lapel one. Why are those the best? Your hands are free, right? You can use your hands for gestures. Between this mic, cordless mic, mic and a corded mic, cordless mic is better because I can walk around. Corded, the one with the cord, especially if it is on a stand like this, you can't move around. And then again, if you have a podium or a lectern, again, you can't move around, right? Now here, they've got this uh, head mic, but because of the disturbance, see these are uh, mics as well. So if you go with that, near that, then it disturbs it. Okay, so you need to know before your presentation what type of mic you're going to be using, right? And if it's uncomfortable for you, then you must tell them to change it. Next thing, if technology is to be used, make sure that you've got a backup plan. Yeah. So if you're going to be using, if you're going to be using their laptop, what if their laptop doesn't function at the right time? And that's what happens to me once when I was a keynote speaker at a school. I went through halfway using their laptop. I tested it the day before, and then it stopped working. Hmm. And I didn't have notes. I didn't have crypt cards. So I just had to now from memory carry on. But the effect was not as good as if I had a backup plan. So if you've got your laptop, rather take your own laptop. Even if they've got one. Now, IPCI, you notice, they've got a laptop there. But I normally take my own. In fact, public speakers who are properly prepared, they will even take a projector. And if they're using their projector, not only that, they will even take a spare bulb for the projector. So if that bulb gives up during the presentation, they've got a spare bulb. That's the detailed preparation one has to make if you want to do a good job. Other things to remember? You have to read, read, read. Now, this reading is reading generally, reading books to write to broaden your knowledge. And that's unfortunately something that our Ummah has forgotten. The majority of it, I mean, the first verse of the Holy Quran was to read. We have forgotten to read, the majority of us, unfortunately. Commence the presentation by praising Allah subhanahu ta'ala and sending salutations to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Commence the lecture with Amma Ba'd. This is the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In the course of your talk, always remember Allah subhanahu ta'ala. Praise Him whenever you get the opportunity. Every time you mention Rasulullah's name, invoke salam on him. If you invoke salam, the audience will also do likewise. It is sunnah to conclude the lecture with a dua. And as the MC, very important, quite often we are the MC. MC is the person who is the organizer or running the function. So quite often, at the end of the presentation, then he might tell the audience to give an applause to the speaker. It shouldn't be done as far as Sharia is concerned. What should be done is praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say Allah Akbar, that sort of thing, or mashallah, or ask the audience to acknowledge by saying mashallah. Right? 
do not insult your listeners, but use good words. Now, this is not from a Western perspective. This is from a Sharia perspective of good things to do. One is, Rasulullah said, Allah is kind and He likes kindness in all things. Kind speech and feeding the hungry guarantee you paradise. Do not criticize the doer, but criticize the behavior. Quite often, someone does something wrong, and instead of just criticizing the behavior, we start criticizing the person. Prophet never criticized a person directly. If something was done uh, against the Sharia, and even if those people were sitting in his audience, he would never embarrass them. He'd say that, why is it that so and so is now doing this, which is not permitted in terms of the Sharia. So the people who are there get the message. But otherwise, some people really embarrass the audience, which is not in terms of the Sharia. <coughs> Keep it short and simple, Rasulullah said, talk to people with speech that, you can un that they can understand. Do you wish that the people rely on Allah and His Messenger? They won't even know what you're saying. Right? So just keep it simple. No matter how many degrees you have, no matter how well qualified you are, no matter how much experience you've got, just keep it simple. Jazakallah. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? Clear. Clear. Might be some questions. Might be some questions. Any questions on anything we've discussed in the past four days? Yes, brother. Yes, But like uh, the last uh, three uh, slides, we talk about like we should like praise Allah and uh, make salah about Muhammad peace be him. But what about if I like to visit a visitation uh, in front of like non-Muslim? Okay, that's a very good point. What if you're making a presentation before non-Muslims? Now, before non-Muslims, it might not be appropriate to talk about the Quran and Hadith, Quran and Hadith. Because if they don't accept Islam, they're not really going to accept what you're saying, what's in the Quran and Hadith. You can mention the same words of the Quran, you can mention the same Hadith of the Prophet without saying it's a Hadith. Because that's truths, what's there, and it's also in their scriptures. So, if I were making a presentation to parents uh, about something, or even any audience, and I would tell them that the intention that we have is the most important. Whatever intention we have before we do something. Now, will that be something that's wrong to a non-Muslim, or a Christian, or, or, or a Jew? No, because that is a simple truth. If I were to say to parents, uh, especially the parents who are looking after disabled children, for example, and if I have to say that paradise lies beneath the feet of the mother, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with that, if, even if you're a non-Muslim? Never. Never. Because if there's non-Muslims in the audience and they are looking after disabled children, and you are saying that this is a fact, they will actually welcome it. it, might even be in the scriptures. So, the point I'm making is, you don't have to say, if there's non-Muslims in the audience, that the Quran says this, the Hadith says this. Mention it, diplomatically, without mentioning that it's coming from the Quran or Hadith. And you'll get your message across. Okay, what about the introduction? Like, should you want like, to start, should I like, say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I'm not So the same thing, translate it into English. And you see a number of speakers, when they're speaking to mixed audiences, that's what they'll say. In the, in the name of God Almighty, uh, and blessing to all His messengers. So you don't only mention Rasulullah so something like that. And that, that's how they normally do it. Yes? Uh, what do you think that uh, there's supposed to be area for the speaker to like, to talk? He shouldn't just come across and touch the audience. Some people say that it's very dangerous because each person has just like boundaries or something. Correct. Like yeah, so they don't like you to touch them, or to, especially if they are, I mean, in the high level, like for example, uh, scholars or, mm. or professors, or something like that. They don't want you to just come across to, or to touch them as well. That's correct. So, so the, 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 yes, that? the point I made was Rasulullah used to even touch Sahaba from time to time. So if a Sahabi came to him and asked him a question, and then Prophet Sallallahu then touched Habu, Azad Habu Azlam, on his chest and he said that okay now you and then whatever he had to say he said it or if he holds his hand like this in a loving way brotherly way 
Now imagine the affection between the two. So it depends on the situation. Yeah, the so you won't do it always. Okay. Sorry? The situation is different because uh, Sahab just came to, to the Prophet Muhammad He didn't talk to the, in the general speech. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Um, I've seen, I've seen public speakers, I've seen in some instances what they do is, especially when they call the audience onto the stage and say that some activity is taking place, they don't have to touch the audience member, but they will actually touch the audience member's hand, right, to show that there's an affinity between them, there's closeness between them. See, so it depends on the situation. You won't now go to someone that you really don't know and then touch them. It depends on the situation. Yes, brother? Speak loudly. What type of language? What, 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 give an example. The word you use is except. Except. Okay. Okay. Like slang. If you're using slang. Okay. The brother's question is: Sometimes you're so used in your in your, in your normal talk to use certain words, even slang words. Slang words, like how you talk with your brother when you're at home, right? So, but you don't use that in public. So, if you are so used to using using those words, how do you overcome that problem? So the thing is, you must you must be aware of the words that you are using, and you must try and avoid using that in situations that are inappropriate. I'll give you an example. Okay, you finish. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. There is one. Uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, when he gives his Juma Bayans, Khutbas, he is in the habit of using slang words, like the words that you might use when you are with your friends. So this young Imam, when he talks, he still uses the slang words when he's speaking to the audience, and we don't like it. As the audience members, we don't like it. Because you don't know who you're speaking to. You might be speaking to a professor there, you might be speaking to a mufti, you might be speaking to anyone. So you must be aware of the words that you are using which are inappropriate. And what you can do is ask your friends when you are speaking in public, is there any word or phrase that I'm using which is inappropriate? And then slowly, slowly you must try and wean yourself off that. Like, like the non-words. If you don't know you're using the non-words, then you won't stop using them. So this is an exercise, it's, it's something that you have to practice. Really, you had your hand up, Mohammed? Um, uh, yeah. Do you think that um, sometimes using the slang words uh, may break uh, the barriers between, between you and the, and the audience? There is a place for slang words, depending on the audience. So if you've got youngsters, or if you, Muhammad, you are giving a talk to your friends, whatever about, so to them, you might use the slang words. Or if I am a teacher, and I've got my classmates or my, my students, and they know that I'm quite a jovial person, and I might use it to them, depending on the situation. So sometimes it's useful, but not always. You just have to be careful. Someone had their hand up in the back? No, no, I'm unsure. I was going to uh, question the same thing. That sometimes what, what happens if you are addressing youngsters? Yes. And youngsters, most of the time, once you don't use their language, Correct. they tend to sleep, they tend to not even want to Correct. to you. So sometimes in order to break the ice or everyone talk to them, there is a place for it. I, I agree. There is a place and time for it. Next question. How do you make sure that you keep your discourse simple? You don't, get, you get, don't go over excited. Like when you're describing something, you, you describe even unnecessary things. How do you make sure that you keep it simple? How, how do you make sure you keep it simple? How do you make sure you're not use, discussing unnecessary things? That takes practice. How do you know that you are not discussing unnecessary things? That's the advantage of having your speech written down. Especially for the people who are starting off, and even for experienced speakers, they always have their speech written down. And then what you have to do, you have to go through the speech and see, for example, are there any slang words there? Are there words that you're using too often you might want to use a simile, or you might want to use 
there's a word that describes the opposites of the word. So you've got one word and you can find the opposite of that word. Forget that word now. Right. So unless you've written down your speech, you won't really know. If you're going to stand up there and on the cuff, just on the spur of the moment speak, then you're going to make all the mistakes that you're talking about. So the best thing I can tell anyone who is, wants to seriously speak in public, write your speech down. Go through it. Again, when you said that regarding whether you're going to lose your audience, so you know during your speech this part is a bit boring. But you won't know when to add all the things to liven it up unless it's written down. So that is, that is the best uh, solution I can give. Yes, brother? Uh, how to control the duration of a uh, ticking question? Or how to stop someone from asking a question in a good way? So, firstly, is to stop them from asking questions or to, to sift out which are appropriate questions? What, what's your question? No, to stop them, to control the duration of taking questions. Okay. Sometimes when it comes to question and answer time, there is the MC, and he will take the questions. Quite often that's what happens in, in, in debates, public debate. He will take the questions, and if it is relevant to the speech, then he will allow it. If it's irrelevant, he won't. Or if it will take a lot of explaining to do to answer that question, then he will say, maybe this can be discussed outside. Right? If you are, if there's no MC and you're handling the questions yourself, then you need to just be diplomatic. See what is appropriate. If there's anything that's going off the topic, don't discuss it. Because then you could go too far away from your topic. Right? So see what questions are asked. Are they appropriate? Have you got sufficient time to answer them crisply and move on? So these are some of the things that you will take into account. But with experience, it will become easier. Any other questions? Yes? What sometimes happens, just a comment, is that if, supposing, say, if you ask for comments from your, from your audience, that you, that assuming you've given this brother Muhammad the, the, the mic, and now Muhammad starts giving a lecture for another 15 minutes <laughs> and now you're wondering how you're gonna stop it which is which happens because when people start talking they start from one section and they just carry on talking now you need to have have a technique so one technique is actually to politely interrupt the person to say oh that point that you made over there is an excellent point over there and now you take the mic away from him and just talk about his last point and you Cutting off already. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a little trick that you you, you, you can do because some people have this habit. Mm. They just want to just talk, 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 and they go into this thing. So you need to be able to be alert and to be able to sort of say, look, cut him off. I think another interesting, uh, important point to make in public speaking is your speech must not come across as a speech. It mustn't come across as a speech. It must come across as a conversation. Just as among friends when you are talking, how comfortable you are when you are talking in, in a conversation, that is how your speech must be as well. Because once it becomes a speech, then it becomes too formal. That's why you'll notice, I'll walk, I'll speak to you all there, I'll speak to your dead group, I'll come back here. If you're standing here behind the podium uh, or a lectern and giving your 40 minutes talk, it appears to be more of a speech. Sometimes you can manage it, but otherwise, Try and make it as if it's a conversation. Sometimes people ask the question also, what if I forget to say something that I'm supposed to say? You've got all the points, but while you're speaking, you realize that point number three I've forgotten and I've already gone on to point number six. What should you do? What should you do? Scratch your head. It depends <laughs> on how important this point is. Yes. If it's like so important, the main idea, you just like find the connection to it. Mm -hmm. If it's like good important, but not that like that part, just skip it and go on. Okay, sometimes people get very excited at the fact that they missed out something. And it actually affects the balance of their speech. Forget about it, unless it is the core of what you're supposed to say. Just forget about it. Because the audience doesn't know what you're going to say. So if you don't say it, they won't be any wiser. So you just carry on. Even if it is a core element of your... If it's a core element, if it's something that is essential for your whole speech, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you shouldn't be forgetting it also. But in any case, if you forget it, then you must come back and, as a brother said, try and link it up mm -hmm. to what you are saying. Mm -hmm. Any other points? We'll, we'll continue with this, uh, this 
segment for another 10 minutes. We've got no time to go on to the other topic. So let's just do justice to public speaking. Yes, brother, you've got your hand up. If, if, you, if your audience doesn't comment or ask any question, does it mean that the speech or wasn't effective to them? Does it mean that it wasn't effective? No. No, no. If you ask, do you have any questions, it's not that they don't understand you. It's just that you're giving them an opportunity. There might be something that requires clarity. Right? So you're giving them an opportunity. No, I'm asking if the audience... Yes. They don't ask, ask, they don't ask any questions. Then maybe you have got through to them. Or maybe you've lost them completely. You are right up there. You've lost them totally. It depends on the situation. But if you are if you are connecting with them, and if they've got uncertainty, they're definitely going to ask you some questions. Or if you anticipate, when you are speaking on a particular topic, and you see that they are wavering in their attention, then maybe maybe you are losing them. So maybe you need to go back and just in the question and answer time, just ask them that point that I made. Did you understand it, or should I elaborate it more? Then someone might just say, yes, we didn't understand it. Okay, anyone else? Uh, just in order to add one thing we really good to share. Uh, the, uh, public speakers, uh, sometimes doctors, sometimes from medical or engineers, yes. uh, different uh, topics. Uh, the slides, uh, which I'm uh, uh, so uh, uh, I would like to introduce that sometimes it should be uh, related to what you are looking to present, like the figures have to be shown, or a video film is required, or even uh, a picture where you, you can uh, uh, explain. Uh, this is what I am looking to show in my talk. So the, the slides that you're using must be relevant to your audience as well, is that what you're saying? Sure. Absolutely. So you know where you're speaking. If you're speaking to a room full of doctors, then the slides that you're using must relate to their profession, to the extent that it is possible, right? But otherwise, then you're gonna be giving other slides and might not really be relevant to them, so it might be a disconnect between you and your audience. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's just uh, move on. So what have we discussed in the past four days? Public speaking from an Islamic perspective, overcoming nervousness. Yes, brother? Got a question? Okay. They're not interested. You've gone there to speak on a particular topic. You prepare for that particular topic. They're not interested in that and they want you to speak on something else. If, you, if you're not comfortable with that topic, then it's very dangerous to speak on it. Because you'll just make a fool of yourself. So you can tell them that this is what I was told to come and speak on. I've prepared for this particular talk. And uh, if it's not relevant, then you need to tell the MC or the person who's organizing, you know, uh, is there anyone else more appropriate to speak about it? Because that's not what I'm supposed to speak on. You're going to make a fool of yourself. That's the main thing. Right? So don't get caught in the trap. Now they're asking you to speak on something else that you are not competent to speak on. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to comment about using the slides to project ideas. Uh, for us, uh, in our college, and sometimes our professors, they use this method. And uh, when they go, two slides forward, two slides back, we are, we are completely lost. But uh, when it comes to, we open the same subject in the YouTube, they illustrate by uh, painting or kind of like uh, drawing the subject, it's far more easier to understand and to digest the, the material. Uh, in fact, I found out there are new methods to present uh, topics without using slides, like using the crazy thing called the crazy, it's a, yes. new, it's a new technology to present uh, certain types of topics. So uh, my, my point is that I think slides are still better, but they are pretty strong. Okay, now that's a good point. You don't only, you don't only have to use slides. You can also use other things. So for instance, you'll notice that there's a board that's going to be coming in later on. Or even if you have a flip chart, 
And if you feel that that is appropriate to use in teaching or in lecturing or getting your point across, nothing wrong with that. So you have your flip chart, it's organized beforehand, and, and then you can get to the flip chart and do whatever you want to show them. The advantage of that, actually there's an advantage to that. The advantage to that is that you can change your speech as you go along, or the sequence of what you're saying. Because the slides, you can't change it. It's all there, so that's, in fact, so you don't, you're not stuck with one method of, 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 of AIDS. Any AIDS that's comfortable to you, but use AIDS as far as possible. Prophet Sallallahu used AIDS. He drew in the ground. So if he's used AIDS, we must also use AIDS the best way to get your message across. Okay, so there's no hard and fast rule. Okay, so we said that what we've covered, public speaking from an Islamic perspective, overcoming nervousness, framework formation, this you recall we did that alliteration and so forth, and this is part of the structure, and we also did the contents of the speech, which was the beginning, the middle, the end, what we had to do as far as the beginning was concerned, the A, B, C, grabbing the attention and so forth, the middle we discussed, that is where you get the meat of your, your speech. So one was contents, what you're going to say. Then we moved on to public speaking artistry, which was a presentation, how you're going to say. Then the attention absorbing structure. This is where you must realize where you probably lose your audience and what you need to get their attention. So we discussed various ways of doing that and things to be wary of, things to do, things not to do. So that's what we discussed there, and that was to get the engagement. So this is what we covered in the past four days. So this is another example of the tell, tell, tell formula. I'm telling you now what we had discussed, so you will recall when you leave this venue. Okay, now we had four days of public speaking presentations done to you. Or you might even have read a book on public speaking. Does that make you a public speaker? No, I don't think. Uh, Doesn't make you a public speaker. So what's required then? Practice, practice training, etc. So even if the professional footballers and other sportsmen do it, so when Lionel Messi, when he was coached by his previous coach, and he's told, okay, these are the things to do, what do you think he did after that? He would go and practice it. Ronaldo. Why do you think that for years these two people are getting the best player of the year award? Because even when the rest of the team have left, they are practicing on their own. They come there even before the team practice starts, they are practicing on their own. So that is what makes perfect, right? So you've, you've got some tools. Today, inshallah, the uh, IPCI officials will be given these slides or the information that I've covered, which is not in the red book. So when you are reading the red book, read it together with what is going to be in your flash disk because there I'll be covering most of the uh, public speaking from a Sharia aspect and what we told you also in order to remember the best is firstly the speech secondly we use the aids thirdly we give you notes but you have to read the notes within two weeks if you read the notes within two weeks then it's going to recall exactly what you have been through so that's as far as this whole program is concerned even if it takes you a month. All the notes that you are given, flesh this, just go through it. So this is essential. This is something that you will definitely have to do. Every opportunity you get to speak, take that opportunity. If someone tells you, okay, who wants to be the MC of this function? Put your hand up. Who wants to give the vote of thanks? Put your hand up. Because without practice, you're not gonna make perfect. Now, you'll recall that when we are growing up, and we took our first steps, first few steps, what happened? Were we able to walk normally? We fell down. Then what happened after that? We stood up, took a few more steps, we fell down. And we continued until we perfected it. Now, imagine if we were like public speakers, scared public speakers, potential public speakers, and said, okay, now I'm taking a chance, and I'm gonna start walking. And the person starts walking like this child, and she falls down, second time she falls down, third time she falls down, and say, Walking is too hard for me, I'm not going to walk. What's going to happen? Never walk. Never walk, sir. That's exactly the case with you people as well. Those of you who are not proficient public speakers and you want to become proficient, you have to practice. Have to practice. If you make mistakes, that's how you're going to learn. 
And I always say to my, my students is, the quicker you make mistakes, and the more mistakes you make, the quicker you will learn. Right, but you won't make mistakes if you're not gonna take a chance. Right, so you have to do that. So, we can't teach you, and I haven't been able to teach you to get rid of those butterflies in your stomach, but what we try to do is to teach you to make them fly in formation, inshallah. And we hope that now you've been taken out from that situation there, to this situation, to that situation, and inshallah to that situation. Jazakallah. One more question before you go. How do you actually condense the information that you get, especially at Asulama? You know, when we when we actually research a topic, it's so vast that you know what it's. Uh, that's what my concern is. Okay, sure. okay, sure. I think we'll discuss that after the after the break during the break. Okay, sure. Okay. Hi, right, Jazakallah. Thank you very much. You've been very good, uh, attentive listeners. Hopefully, I haven't lost you all during the four days. If I haven't, then Alhamdulillah, I've done. Uh, I've been able to keep your attention. But Jazakallah for that. Okay, Jazakallah, Advocate Vaid. I think this session has been a very interesting session. And the thoughts that went through my mind while he's speaking over here that if we have to read a book about how to swim, do you think we will ever be able to learn how to swim unless you go and dive into the pool and try? And exactly the same thing applies over here. That with public speaking, you have to try it. And, and, and especially for our younger brothers who are in university, I'd like to just share a few minutes, a little experience when I went into university. And, uh, we, at, in the 1980s, the universities was uh, on boycotts and uh, against the apartheid government in South Africa. And in one meeting at the university hall, there was over 2,000 uh, students over there, and we were on boycott, and they were drafting a list of proposals or recommendations that they wanted to do, hand in to the administration of the university. So various things came through, and somewhere along the line, one student went up, and he says that in, we want on our campus a pub for drinking alcohol. And I'm sitting, standing right in the back, I never did any public speaking, uh, didn't prepare any speech or anything like that, and it just says this is wrong over here. And that was, I think, a most difficult walk that I had from the back of the hall to go up onto the stage, and I said that, look, before we ask a thing like this over here, we must remember in apartheid that this alcohol is an instrument of oppression, and if you want to open up a pub in South Africa over here, a shibin, that's what they call it, it's very easy, but if you want to open up a school, you need to have to apply to so many different departments and get uh, this thing over there. And then the idea fell flat. But the point that I'm saying is that you need the courage at times. You're not preparing a speech and things like that, but don't be afraid. This may not just go and say what you are thinking, and that has an effect. With these few words, okay, we conclude the session over here. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nasalli ala Rasulil Kareem. Allah Rabb. A'uzu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qala Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul ubdatan min lisari yafqa wa qawmi. Amma ba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome your brothers to this uh, workshop on leadership development. We have approximately three hours. Uh, we We'll be doing some leadership, uh, uh, we'll cover some leadership topics, and depending on the mood of the delegates, we'll decide whether we're going to go on to the strategy or not. The strategy is a bit on the heavy side, so we just want to see now how, how it goes. Uh, my part is going to be very interactive, uh, very enjoyable. It's going to be uh, fun and games, but there's messages in uh, this whole program. So firstly, we just need to get some ground rules in place. Pretty the other brothers are not here, but they will join us just now. And some of the things that we will just bear in mind are the following. This program that I'm doing with you for two or three hours, normally I spend five days to for the students to really get uh, full benefit out of it. So I'm just going to take a little from one day and present it to you. And inshallah, in the future, if you come down for the five-day program, then 
we get the full benefit. So, just a few ground rules. Uh, try have, to have no distraction whatsoever with your cell phones and so forth. Then, this is to focus on yourself. This whole program, uh, a presentation today is to focus inwardly. Normally we want to change others, but you can't change others if you can't change yourself. Allah SWT says in the Holy Quran also, if you want to change, uh, then you need to change yourself first, right? So this presentation is really about changing yourself. Uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction, especially when the younger people come in. So it's not going to be a gripe session complaining about this organization and this person and that person. So it's not going to be about that. Uh, whatever is mentioned in these four walls is going to be strictly confidential. Uh, so even if you divulge anything, that uh, rest assured that it will be held in the strictest of confidence. Uh, you have got some writing material, so any gems that you're picking up from this presentation as we go along, then make a note of it because it will be of assistance to you. What we normally do when I have this workshop for three to five days, and at the end of each day, we give them a, an assessment. All the gems they picked up from the three or four sessions during the day, then they write it down. The next day we come, we discuss it. At the end of each day, they get such uh, assessment. But in your case, because we won't be having the assessment, so just write down as you go along. Now, what we require from each of you is to introduce yourselves. Uh, I know you all know each other. But just tell us your name, uh, what's your occupation, and uh, which part of Saudi Arabia you come from. So th these are the three things. And as soon as we finish that, then I want to, you to also mention what do you expect to get from this program. So I think let's start from Brother Zakir on my right. And if you can give your name firstly, uh, what's your occupation, uh, which part of Saudi Arabia you come from, and what you expect to get out of this program. Uh, Wa alaikum salam. Thanks for the most good introduction uh, about ourselves. My name is Zaki al I'm working in the Saudi Army as an engineer in the field. The uh, only thing I can say is that I come from Al Hasra, and uh, what I'm expecting from this. Uh, leadership program is to give us a uh, strategic way of how we can get uh, uh, the right leader in the future, inshallah. Inshallah, okay. Uh, my name is uh, Faid uh, Shamari. Zahid. Faid Shamari. Okay. So there is the Hasa region. Uh, my uh, job okay, is uh, a teacher for learning resource. Uh, I think, okay, and uh, I expect from this, okay, because uh, we shall, okay, get benefit, uh, which is how can we develop ourselves in the management of the Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm sort of opinion, I'm 42 years old, uh, I'm from Al Hassan, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a social worker, Phil, bachelor, and I did run this last course. I accept not to receive because I mean, you are more experienced than us. I accept to uh, present some skills how to to to, to gain uh, experience and information and knowledge from every way from application for reference as I was done for Okay. Thanks. This is your brother Carson Victory. Supervisor, of English language. supervisor for uh, English, language. English language. Yeah, in the Ministry of Education. Uh, I come from Al Hassa, but I'm staying in Denmark, which is about 140 kilometers from Al Hassa. Uh, what I expect from this course is to gain some skills and strategies, uh, in leadership, and to use it later on in my future. And that's it. This is uh, Ibrahim. Yes. Student in the College of Medicine. I'm doing my fourth year now. Uh, my expectation for this program is that we are going to learn the leadership of uh, the 
other colleagues and the other colleagues that you are working uh, working with in our fields, all the fields, and not only leadership by action, also leadership of the speech is, is deviating from the main points of our sessions or our rules and things like that. So we can really direct direct what we are going to Okay. Computer science. Allah. Yes. Hey, Allah. Now, during the next few hours when we are speaking when you are speaking you're going to be speaking on your own behalf you're not going to be saying we and they and so forth so when you speak it's about yourself only and you must use I but this is the humble I this is not the boasting I I so you're only talking about yourself because in these workshops, what we notice is that we are so used to talking about we did this and we should do this and we should do that. And, uh, but you don't represent anyone else. In life, you don't represent anyone else. You represent yourself. So in this workshop, you must just be speaking about yourself. Now, the notes that you've been given, that you can do in your own time. You can do reading on it because we might be covering some parts of it, but it, it, uh, today's presentation is not focused on that, right? Now, uh, must bear in mind that our mind is not a vessel to be filled, but it's a fire to be ignited, right? And there's a beautiful saying, he who knows others is learned, but he who knows himself is wise, right? So the idea is we need to get to know who we are. Once we know who we are, then we can improve ourselves and try and improve the world as well. Now, there was an interesting parable. There was uh, one of the blue chip companies in Japan. And the CEO of that company, I don't know if it's Mitsubishi or some such big company. So the CEO went to the Zen master. And he wanted some words of wisdom from the Zen master. So the Zen master then offered him some tea. So he said, okay, I will have it. So the Zen master started pouring the tea in a cup. And as he's pouring the tea, green tea, it was, the cup was overflowing, but he continued pouring it. So then this person who went there stated, uh, master, master, can't you see that the, the cup is overflowing? And uh, he said, yes, I know that it is overflowing. But well, this is what he said. You too have come with a full cup. How can you learn when your cup is full? Right? Mm -hmm. So that's important. For learning, we, over the years, we've learned a lot of things. But if we want to make a new start, then it's also important to unlearn what we've learned. Because over the years, we might have learned the wrong things. So it's important that sometimes it's necessary for us to unlearn what we've learned and to learn things the correct way. So this is the point that the Zen master was making, that uh, you've come with your cup full. So you need to empty that cup to take in the words of wisdom. Okay, so the, with those few words, I think we can make a start. Do you have any questions at all before we commence? Uh, just, uh How many sections? Uh, are we going to have any instructor after you? 
after me, well, the intention today was to have me doing this here and Brother Ahmed Sheikh doing uh, strategy. Now, strategy is a bit heavy stuff, right? What I'm doing is much, I'm making it very much lighter. So let's go through for halfway through the three hours and we'll see Yopo's concentration span and whether we should now then do the strategy part because if you're still fresh and things and to do the strategy Ahmed say Sheikh is prepared to come through but let's just play it by ear that, that that's the that's that's how we've planned it so your plan is to have up to five o'clock up to five o'clock yes and two, uh, you and Ahmed. between the two of us we will share the presentation so mine is more on leadership and he is on strategy we are lucky to see him both okay alhamdulillah so let's as i mentioned strategy is heavy stuff <laughs> it's right so if you are up to it that you have a session with him his will take about one hour 15 minutes then we can do that as well but that's left to you you decide after we start right Right. What we're going to be commencing with is what's called perceptions. This is very important in life. It's a life skill and it's very important in leadership as well. And we're going to do a simple exercise. I'm going to show you the photograph of a person just now and I'm going to ask you a few questions about him. And you're going to make a note, sure. whatever you feel about this person. Now I went for a course to a leading business school in South Africa went for the two whole week course and what I'm doing with you now is what that gentleman did with us. He was the uh, coordinator of this whole program, two week program. And this is what he did, which I'm going to be doing with you now. His, his name was Chris Vereen. And I'll tell you a bit about him. We were seated in a semicircle, so there were no tables. We were sitting in a, sit in a semicircle. He sat in front and about 10 or 12 of us sat around. We were from different countries in Africa. And what you need to know about him, he's 60 years old and he walks with a limp. And now he wanted us to tell him about himself, what we think about him. And here's his photograph. Now these are the questions that you're going to answer now in your book. What discipline you think he is from? That was a business school where I went, right? And he was the teacher. What car do you think he drives? Why does he walk with a limp? What musical interest does he have? And what's the nationality of his daughter-in-law? His son got married to a girl. So that girl, what's her nationality? Right, I'll give you about five minutes. Write these the answers to these questions down in your book, then I'll ask okay. each one. Previous one. Uh, can I know the, the, go back to the previous slide? Yes. This is the guy. This is the guy. His name again? Chris Breen. Chris Breen. Okay, write it down, please. What 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 uh, profession? Uh, what profession? What what work has he been doing? Mm -hmm. What work he has been doing? Yeah, he uh -huh. has been doing. What was his speech? Speech. It was training like this. Yeah, yeah. What he did for us? Leadership, leadership training.
Dan. Okay. So who wants to start? Right. Anyone? Now in, in, in these workshops that I do, I don't ask anyone to start. Whoever wants to start, he must pick up his hand, and then the person on his right is next. So who wants to start? You want to start? Yes. Okay. Comments? What what discipline? What discipline? Uh, animal science. Animal science. Scientist. 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 Animal science. science. Uh, okay. Veterinary. Okay. Vet. We have Land Rover. Land yeah. Rover. Okay. Oh. And we have accident. They got. Motor uh, accident. He, he was. <laughs> how you uh, Well, he was the journey. They got. They got Yes. Okay. He's down. Okay. Small accident. Yeah. Right. He like Mozart. 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 Okay. Uh, I think his daughter, I mean, because he's still stuck in this area. He's South African. Yeah. I think he's white South African. Yes. But his daughter, his gave up and get another nationality from Australia. So white, white Australia. Okay. What do you say? No, no, you have to. What discipline? What occupation? What profession? You're still busy. Okay. I think it's really human resources. Human resources, okay. The car is like. I think that. Station wagon. Station wagon, like a combi. Combi, yeah. Like a combi, okay. And, uh, he was fallen from a tree, that's why he... <laughs> he fell from a tree, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, music, I think, yeah, was what Michael Lee says, uh, classic. Classic, okay. And uh, drug, national activities, like Zulu. Zulu, okay. That's, all. that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think... Uh, Nationality of the daughter-in-law? Yeah, this is 
you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. You okay? Same, same, uh, oh, same. Okay. All right. You want to take a chance? All right. Well, I think he's a scientist. Scientist. Okay. What what science? Which which field of science? Is it uh, maybe, you get your chemistry, biology, I, physics, mathematics? Maybe, maybe biology. Biology. Okay. Mm -hmm. He has maybe land over. Okay. And the, 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 uh, the way he walks is that because he has an accident, or he had an accident. What? What accident? Maybe he has fallen down. Okay. Uh, classical music. Yes. I think the nationalities of his daughter is as the same as his nationality is South African. South African. Okay, will it surprise you all if I tell you that all of you all are wrong for everything? <laughs> will it surprise you? That's good. It will surprise you? No. Won't surprise you? I'm not surprised. Why aren't you surprised? Because he is different from what you say. Because he's different from what you say? Yes. Okay, so he is, in his time, he was a professor of mathematics. Wow. And he was one of the he had reached the highest in mathematics in the country and he was uh, the chairman of the Mathematics Teachers Association in South Africa and he was also lecturing mathematics at the university and this is the best university in South Africa. Then what car does he drive? He drives a VW station wagon, not a SUV, station wagon, right? Uh, why does he walk with a limp? That was a sporting injury, okay. sporting injury. Because when he was young, the sport that he used to take part in was athletics, hurdles, 110 meter hurdles. And that's one of the most difficult sports. 100 meters is difficult, hurdles on top of it is even more difficult. And I'll show you his photograph just now. Here's his photograph. He was taking part in a uh, athletics meeting in South Africa against foreign countries. Here's a university, UCT, University of Cape Town. Here's here. Right, so that's that injury that he got because over the during years. During this walk? Sorry? During this running? During this, the same run? No, not this one, but over the years. Over the years. Because he's jarring his knees all the time. Jumping, 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 right? So that's how he got that. Then, musical interest, he likes African music from Africa. African music. Yes. So when he used to go for the workshop every day, the music used to be on in the morning. And all different African music. And we had in that group, we had about uh, people from about seven different African countries. So they used to identify with this music coming from their country. So that's what, and he used to love dancing. And the nationality of his daughter-in-law, his son got married to an Indian girl from India. <laughs> no, I didn't mention it. Because I like Zulu. Huh? Zulu is a good word. Uh, I thought he's in my Okay, so... Because he's white. And that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what does that indicate to you? This exercise that we did, what does it indicate to you? My own expectation has gone Your expectation is different from yeah. reality. Yeah. Okay, let's do one other simple exercise before we discuss it further. Right. Tell me a little bit about myself, about me. Uh, right. The, the first one, you probably know some part of it. Uh, what did I study and what work I did? Right, so that you should know if you were awake when I was <laughs> introduced the first time, right? Yeah. So what, what I studied and what work I did. Secondly, how many children I have and uh, are they male or female and how many? Right, so the sexes, Good. Good. right? You make that's it easy for us. Right, that's two. Thirdly, Surround. thirdly, uh, what what is my passion? What is it that I like doing? Passion, right? Mm -hmm. And fourthly, what is my hobby? Okay. So firstly, studies and work. Secondly, children and their sex, how many and male, female. Thirdly, what is my passion? And fourthly, what is my hobby? Study, passion, hobby. Study, passion. 
Third is passion, what I like doing. And fourthly, what is my hobby? Hobby is, yeah. Okay. It's similar, but hobby is slightly different, right? Ladies might have knitting as their hobby or whatever, right? What, what is the study? Hobby. The study, children. children. Uh, how many, and male or female? And passion? Study. And hobby. Okay. Children. Passion. passion. Study children, passion, purpose. Well, let's really unfinish. Okay, who wants to start? Uh, who wants to start? Who wants to start? start? Anyone? Right. Yeah, he'll be second. Yeah, he'll be second. Start. I think you uh, finished your Islamic studies. Yes. Yeah. Okay, no matter. Sorry? Two male sons. No, no, so, so just Islamic study, that's what I need yeah, to say. Yeah. Right, okay. You have uh, two sons, one daughter. Two sons, one daughter, okay. The passion is teaching. Passion is teaching, right. And reading and walking. Reading and walking. <laughs> okay. Zero. Hmm? Zero percent of. <laughs> you want to? Islamic studies. Islamic studies, okay. Teaching. teaching, okay. Uh, uh, you got, I think, two sons and one daughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your passion is developing uh, people. Okay. Doing courses. Okay. Yeah, training courses. All right. And your hobbies could be. Some sports, maybe. Like walk, walking. Okay, that's fine. The next. Uh, I think uh, study again human resource. Well, human resource. Uh, <laughs> I expect um, children, uh, two boys as far as merchant story that and one girl. Okay. Uh, and hobby maybe maybe cricket. Cricket, okay. Uh, Passion is, I think, giving delivering Sorry? courses. Sorry? Delivering courses. Okay, next. Okay. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I think you have two bachelor's degrees. Sorry? Two bachelor's degrees. Yeah, two master's two specializations. Which ones? I believe that you have got uh, in uh, management. Yes. And Islamic studies as well. Management and Islamic studies, okay. Okay. Yes. Um, working is a professor. Uh, professor of what? Uh, 
politics. Politics, okay. Uh, you're studying as uh, extra mathematics. Okay. You have no children. How many? You have no children. No children, okay. Uh, your, your passion uh, is uh, modern art. Passion is modern, modern, art. modern art, okay. Your hobby is skydiving. Skydiving. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, this is his, uh, his hobby. That's his hobby. This is, his, his, this is Muhammad. Yes. He's looking to be a professor and uh, <laughs> skydivers are trainers. No, no, skydivers. He's so bad. Okay, next. So, children, you have two boys. Yes. Jogging and reading, yes. Your passion is giving courses. Courses, okay. Uh, studies uh, human resources and uh, Okay, those of you who came late, we are going to move on. But what I asked uh, everyone was, we are doing what's called perceptions. And uh, I put on the screen a photograph of a gentleman and I asked four questions about him. And everyone gave their different, different opinions about what he was doing and etc. And all of them were wrong, right? So I said, let's make it easier, and they must say something about me. Oh, and nothing, therefore, nothing wrong? Or everyone, before, no, no, before. about the other person. They got, every, everyone was wrong. So now I said, let's make it easier, now that you've been with me for one week. And uh, let's see if you are any closer. So he said, the first question was what I studied and what work I did. I studied law, uh, then I studied Sharia. So that was my study. What work I did, I practiced as a, uh, first I was a prosecutor in the court, and then a magistrate in the court, right? Then like a Qadi. Then uh, I practiced as an advocate, barrister. Then uh, I lectured law at the university, right? And uh, then I worked at the bank as a banker in the legal field, and, uh, and now I'm teaching and doing my own consulting, right? So you can see now how many of you got that right. Then, number of children, all of you are wrong. Uh, I, I got two grandchildren. Eh? Who said I got no children? <laughs> I got two grandchildren. So I got four, four sons. Four sons, right? No daughters. And uh, passion, some of you got it right. Passion is to develop leadership in people and uh, teaching, not like school teaching, but teaching and uh, uh, delivering courses and so forth, right? And my hobby, I'm surprised. I thought at least one of you would get it right. Okay, the three of you came late. What do you think of my hobby? It's a golden chance. Golden chance. Yeah. Your hobby mean? My hobby. What's my hobby? Public speaking. Public speaking. <laughs> I think riding horses. Riding horses. Reading? Reading. Reading. They have to read it, but it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, something else. Reading was my hobby before, but it's no longer a hobby. Practicing sports or something? Practicing sport. Which sport? General. Idea. Sorry? General idea. Golf. General idea. Tennis. Tennis. I think you, you prepare something manual. Something manual. That you do with your hands. Because I'm too old. <laughs> because I'm too old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, gold. Gold is the... Uh, the uh, For the rich people. Right. I can play rich people. Painting. Painting. Okay, I'll give you a tip. Collecting stamps. Okay. <laughs> Collecting currency. <laughs> joking. I'll give you a tip. Uh, <laughs> it's close to what you're going to do today. Diving. Fishing. Fishing. Swimming. 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 Shark cage. Shark cage. Shark cage. Swimming. 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 What did you learn from this exercise? Uh, how to make perceptions. And how to, how to make perceptions. How, yeah. to, how to imagine. 
hard to imagine what else. Expect the unexpected. Sorry? Expect the unexpected. Right? What else? Sometimes we forget the information, knowledge that we do the practice. We will forget. Sometimes you forget. Because you mentioned some of the, that. Uh, the okay, mission. some of the we things you mentioned earlier. Five yes? I learned from this exercise that uh, you should not judge from what you see. You have to think. So you, you don't judge a book by its cover, correct? So when you see something, you see someone, immediately we draw a conclusion about him or her, have a perception about that person. In leadership, that's very important. In leadership, that's very, very important because when people we are interacting with, we've got a certain opinion of that person and our relationship with that person depends on the perception that we've got of the person, but might be totally wrong, right? So, Everything we're going to be doing today is all relating to leadership, but as I told you, it's going to be something totally different from what you're accustomed to. Okay, let's move on. Can I just see if why this thing is not... Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna give you all a very simple exercise now. Okay, I'll get... Just trying to get that there. Okay, take your... Uh, you need to observe and write. And I'll give you 30 seconds. Right, you're gonna see something on the board. If you can't have a clear view, Make place for yourself. You don't have any excuses that you were obstructed. It's a very simple exercise. So there mustn't be any excuses. Right. So I'm going to show you a sentence, one sentence, one paragraph. And I want you all to count how many F's there are in that sentence. F, F for football, F. So how many F's you see in that one sentence? I'll give you 30 seconds, no more. Right, so have you got a clear view, everyone? No excuses, then someone is blocking me. How long is the sentence? No, very short, very short. It's about uh, four lines, four lines, right? Right, go, 30 seconds. And just keep it to yourself, don't talk about it. Five seconds more. Four. Three, two, one, done. You're counted. Yes. You wrote it down. Yes. Write it down. Yes. You can get a switch light, please. Eh? Don't show anyone else. Do you mean letter for the word F? Yes, wherever the, wherever the F appear. We have the little not yet for five. Sorry? No, those are not your okay. almost because there's a whole exercise we've been doing now. Right? So there's two, four, two, four, six, eight, ten of you. He just left. Okay, he can join the second one. Okay, he can join the second one. Okay, so let's start. Who counted only one? Pick up your hand. Only one? Yeah. Only one F. Now I'm starting. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyone? Only one F? No. Two Fs. Three Fs. Four Fs. 
Take up your hand if you can't afford it. Five Fs. Right. No, I'm not saying you're right. I'm acknowledging it. Five. Six Fs. Two of you. Seven Fs. Three of you. Four of you. Eight Fs. Three of you. You counted? No. You went out. Nine Fs. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you counted how many? Five. 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 Come forward, please. Muhammad. Yeah. You counted five, and how many there? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Two, four, six, eight, nine. Nine of them counted <laughs> more than five. So are you right or are they right? I think I'm right. You're right. Yeah, so. And they are wrong. Yeah, I think so. They're wrong. Uh, I don't know, maybe, but I think I'm right. Definitely you're right. No. Not? Of not no. Why not? Uh, maybe I missed the word or something. So you want to change your mind? Uh, no. You don't want to change your mind. You're confident that you counted right. Yeah. So they counted wrong. So, so tell them you can't count. Can't count. Okay. <laughs> Alright, thank you, Mohammed. Just again. Just issue. You did not ask about the zero. I only asked about it. How many Fs you see? Yeah, but I want to know so much or no Fs. Sorry? No one who got no Fs. No Fs appeared to him. You saw no Fs? Yeah. No, no Fs. And what, uh, the word was who, is, who got no answer? No, no one got no answer. Right. So that was, you had five. Five, right. Six, two, two, two at six. Come forward, please. What of you are medical students? Uh, well, uh, he is engineering. He is engineering. Industrial. What, in the, what engineering? Industrial. System. Industrial engineering. And you are? Medical. Fourth year medical student. And what of you counted? Six. Both of you counted six. Yes. And uh, you're sure that you are right? To a certain again. extent. Certain extent? Yeah. But what do you mean by certain extent? You're right or you're I mean, wrong? Uh, I was given more time. Maybe. If you were given more time, then maybe you would have I would, counted. I would be more sure. More sure. Uh, so okay. But in your mind, you are correct? Yes, as far as I and so they will be incorrect? Yeah. They're incorrect? Yeah. Tell them you are incorrect. Well, no hard feelings. <laughs> you are incorrect. You guys can't count. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you you can't count. Okay. I can count because I'm a, a medical student. <laughs> uh, I can't count because I'm a medical student. And you guys can't count? Yeah, you guys can't. You are definite that you are correct? No. No? No. <laughs> what do you mean? I think uh, they are correct. They are correct? Yes. If they are correct, then you, you are correct or you are incorrect? If I saw a dollar out of uh, people, yeah. I think there is uh, uh, I am in, I am in incorrect. You are? In incorrect. Incorrect. Just incorrect. So, but but uh, as far as you are concerned, you are correct? No. You're not correct. Yeah. So they are correct. Yes. Wow. You should okay. say no. Yeah. So uh, wh why you say you're incorrect? Because maybe I lose uh, some helps. Yeah, but he also counted the same number as you. And I, and I uh, count uh, six. Yes. But I think they are correct. You think they are correct? Yes. So you counted wrong? Yes. And you're the engineering student? Yes. And you're supposed to be good in counting. <laughs> Not inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. Right, so that is six. Who counted seven? How many of you counted seven? One, two, three, and you also counted seven. Come forward, please. Right, so out of the ten, four of you counted seven. So that's the largest number who counted one number. Four of you counted seven. So, 
So as far as you are concerned, you must be correct. Yes. Definitely. Uh, no, no, regard me because I do it twice. I, I have finished this uh, course, uh, speeding reading. Yes. So I, I do the graph twice. You read it twice? Yeah, to, do, to, to double check. Today you read it twice? Yeah, I did it twice. So you're definite that you're correct? I'm correct. You're correct? I am correct. So but, you? but maybe I am not correct. Maybe. Yeah. You, even though you read it twice? Maybe, maybe. It happens sometimes. Maybe There's three other. Uh, engineers and others, medical student, and uh, you're involved in not, teaching. Not, not medical student, linguistic. Linguistic. Yeah. Okay, so he must be very, very good in, yeah, in Ifs. Maybe. So I'm talking about myself. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because I maybe I'm under so, some stress. So maybe I missed something. But I do it twice as a, as as, as, I as far as you are concerned, you are correct. Yes, yes. But they could also be correct, or, or they are wrong. Well, he, so six to eight, maybe. Six to eight. Maybe I am. Uh, Seven, but uh, one, two, three, no, no. Okay. I'm sure. And you, brother? Yeah, I think I'm. Correct. You correct? Yeah, I think so. Because I, I did it twice. You counted twice. Yeah. So you must be correct then. Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I so, so. Okay. He also counted twice. He counted also seven. Yeah. So uh, these guys can't count. Uh, I can't say this, but. Uh, no. Are they right? No, they're not. No. They're not right. No, but I, I can't say that they, they can't count. I mean, they, they might, I mean, there's some words, but in general. I mean, but you agree that both of you can't be correct? Uh, for me, 10% are not correct, but 90% are correct. 90% you're sure? Yeah. Brother, you're definite that you counted I'm seven. Sure, I'm sure, inshallah, uh, seven. You counted seven. Yeah. And you got support of three others who also counted seven. So it makes you confident that you're right. Inshallah. And that they are wrong. Because I have revised the paragraph two. To you also saw it twice. <laughs> Oops. So they must be wrong then. Maybe. Hmm? Are they wrong? Maybe they are. They're wrong. You tell them. You guys can't count. They are here in the book. No, no, no. You must tell them. You tell them from your mouth. You can't okay. count. Because the al okay, this is twice. Uh, you read it twice? Okay. Yes. There are three words to start with F. Yes. And the four, uh, four words, okay. With the right. Yeah. So they can't count. Tell them. Tell them you guys can't count. I think you can. Okay. Tell, look at me in, in the eyes and tell them you guys. I'll tell them. Okay. You can't count. Yeah. Okay. I tell them. Doctor. Son. Son. I think they are okay. They're wrong. Okay. And brother Zaki. Yeah. With respect to you, you are all wrong. I'm doing it seven. Yes, twice you counted. Yes. You counted twice. Once. Once. <laughs> and you're an engineer. True. And you work for Aramco. Thank you. So you must be right. He's the leader. No, uh, I should be right. He's the should be right. He's the leader. Yeah. Has to be right. Leader has to be right. Or Amir. Huh? Amir has to be right. Okay. But uh, yes? sorry, with respect to you, you are wrong. Bro. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Those of you who counted eight, come forward, please. Only two. Three. You're a medical student. Three. Didn't you see? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so one is a linguist, one is an English teacher, English uh, educator, and you're a medical student, and you're a student. Yes. Okay. You sure you counted eight? Yes. You sure eight is right? Definitely. Definitely. Yes. So the guys who saw less than that, they can't count. They can't count. Tell them. You can't count. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be here. You should be Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, you're wasting your time here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, you can't be leaders. For your good luck, for your good luck, we're leaving tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. He's quite clear. I have counted two or twice. Twice you counted. Yeah, um, Definite. Eight is right. 99.99%. percent So these guys, these guys can't count. Yeah. They, they can't, but maybe they were, they were, you were wrong. But maybe you can count next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and shake you. You definitely you right. You made it uh, too difficult for two reasons. Mm -hmm. You broke your uh, promise by saying that it is uh, one sentence, <laughs> while in fact it's a short paragraph. <laughs> paragraph, paragraph. This, uh, okay. this is the first okay, thing. Okay, right. He's an English Englishman. Okay. The second thing is that you said. Uh, just, just find the letter F. That's correct. And we, we, we felt that it's easy. Yes. But you terrified us. Terrified us. <laughs> yes, you terrified us. Okay. How, 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 how difficult task it is. Okay. Anyway.
Interesting. So many of them disagree with you. So was it difficult or easy? Well, it's, 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 it's uh, difficult in the sense that you told us about. Okay. <laughs> so you're definitely but, right. But um, I'm 100%. You're definitely wrong. 100% that it's, they can't it's, count. it's eight, eight relatives. They can't count. They can't count, but they couldn't. They, they couldn't count. They didn't do it. They, they couldn't succeed. count. Yeah. So you're going to tell them you guys can't count. Yeah, they can't. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Take a seat. If I give you another chance to look at it, do you think you might get it right this time? Yeah, yeah. we already did. Yes, we, did. We, we have to make it. It can't be nine. It can't be nine. Okay, let's try again. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Right, this time how many people counted five? Don't count it five. How many, how many people counted six? Don't count it six. How many counted seven? Yes. I, I didn't say. You still counted seven. I know, now I hit this eight. eight. So you counted seven. Seven, and you? Eight. And who counted eight? Okay. Brother Muhammad from Egypt. You you sure you count the correct? No. No. <laughs> Why not? Twice you counted it. Yeah. No. So how many are they? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm correct or not. You're not sure. No. You could be correct. I could be, but. <laughs> so, so these guys are they correct? What do you think? They correct or you correct? Because I'm the only one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? Uh, if you're the only one, what does that mean? Uh, maybe I'm the I'm not right. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Maybe. Maybe you're right. Yeah. Still maybe. <laughs> Still maybe. Okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Six. You count six. Hey, <laughs> some people have left you. Even the two guys, two guys left you in the lurch, <laughs> right? You just don't feel that you are right. Uh, as far as, as far as I did, my thing is six. six. Yeah. Definitely, these guys can't count. Yeah. Tell them you can't count. You can. No, I know. Definitely, you can you count. Definitely can count. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> At six, seven. How many saw seven? One. <laughs> The first time also you saw seven. No, first time you saw six. six. Yes. Okay, so this time you're right. Are you right this time? No, or you? No, I think they are right. They are right? Yes. Why you say they are right? Because, because I can't read the last one. You can't read it. Why? At the time. Oh, because of the time. Yes. So you say they could be right. Yes. You could be wrong. Good. Okay, thank you. And who saw eight? Come forward, eight. please. Eight. All those saw eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of six out of eleven. This time, you definitely you're right. Yes, I do it. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If I, uh, uh, do it one by one. One, one yes. line, three line by two line. Yes. So I think this is uh, eight. So these guys definitely can't count. No, no, no. I don't. I am talking about that. I'm talking about. No, no. Now we finish about you. Now we talking about them. No, no. I don't, maybe they see it from other corner, from other, from other way. Maybe they would say uh, speedily, slowly. Forget myself. I think that's it. No. Okay. Yeah. You first time you counted. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What do you think? I've counted this. Definitely. Counted, yeah, I've counted twice, so I think. You counted twice. Yeah. So these guys must be wrong then. I think so. Yeah. I, I could miss something, yes. but ninety-nine percent. 
And then especially one, two, three, four, five, six, the majority of you are eight, so these guys must be wrong then. No, not must be, but almost must be, you know? <laughs> so tell them you guys, tell them you guys are wrong. You are wrong. Tell him, tell him, tell him, look in your eyes and tell him. Uh, you are, you can count actually, but <laughs> this time, you must Okay, up. Muhammad? Yes. You're definite, you're right. Yeah, sure. The these guys can't count. Yes, again. And again, you're going to tell them, you guys you can't shouldn't count. be here. No, 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 Okay, and you guys are not sure that you saw eight. Yeah, and I apologize last time, I said seven, and now you are not counting anymore. Now you're definitely that they're wrong. Yes. Hmm? So you yeah. were wrong. I so previously you were wrong. wrong. Yes. I think I was correct, I'm still correct. You're still correct? Yes. Yeah, first time, how many you saw? Same. You saw eight also? Yeah, yeah. So now you're yeah. definitely that you're correct? This is the third time I see. Third time, so you can't be wrong. Thank you very much. Take a seat. <coughs> right, for the brothers, let's just start counting again. Start counting again? Right, let's start. Leadership is about self. One. Development, it means finding. Two. The true person in you, one cannot lead if. Three. Four. Five. Five. Six. Six. Seven. Seven. Eight. 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 Mama just saw eight. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And <laughs> the other guy, you also saw eight. No, I can't. Now you saw it. Now you can no, count. Can. Now you can't count. No, we can't. Now you can't count. Okay, brothers. So, tell me, what did we learn from that? What did we learn from that? Uh, learning how to be self-confident. Learning how to be self-confident uh, yeah. and how to respect others. How to respect others. Point of view, yes. Other points of view. Mm -hmm. Robert? Uh, if you are very, don't hurry. Sorry? If you, if you are very, yes. don't hurry. If you hurry? Don't hurry. Don't? Hurry. I mean, if you want to do something real fast, yes. don't do it fast. Oh, don't do it fast. Okay. Okay. But you did it fast the first time. Yes, yeah, but then I do it so. Okay. Uh, I mean, even if you are a leader, uh, you, you might do something wrong. Mm -hmm. And you must apologize. You must apologize if you're wrong. Okay. Well, we might accept. We, may, we should accept. Uh, not we. We're not talking about we. What did I tell you in the beginning? You guys came late. When we talk, we talk about I, small I, not the boastful I, because generally we are in the habit of saying we and they and so forth. And you must talk about yourself, right? Because you don't represent anyone else. You represent your own thoughts. Okay, I. In this exercise, you mentioned uh, I should not insist on uh, my decisions, even they are. Even I think that they are. Too dogmatic and being firm that you are definitely right and we are wrong. So how should you look at things? I should, uh, first of all, I should give the consensus of people. Mm -hmm. Not to take one decision, uh, mm -hmm. one try made. Uh, mm -hmm. I should give some opinions and suggestions around me mm -hmm. that would have to make But if you had, you had two, two other people, would you? Yeah, and all of you were wrong. Exactly. So? So even even though you you have consensus, two or three people, that the majority have got a different view, so does it mean that you are right? Well, maybe my my sight is limited. Mm -hmm. uh, I view things that I want it to be. This is what I want to be. It yeah. must be, even if you don't be, if you don't agree, you have to do. It. I think that's. Uh, okay. Don't say. Uh, don't say. Uh, You can't be 100% sure. Because maybe the other people is uh, see the other thing, I can see. Okay, all right, you? Uh, just take the opinion of the majority. Take the opinion of the majority. What is the majority around? Uh, 
workshop is we have what's called group think in meetings. We discuss how meetings should be held. And then there's what's called group think. How people think in a group. And there's studies being carried out that if there's about five or six people they see th something, the one person sees something in his mind is correct. But the other people, because it's, it's all uh, choreographed, the other people will say it's wrong. All the time it's right. What you have seen is right. But they say, the first person say something else. Second person will support him. Third person will support him. When they come to you, and you are the one who is correct, because all those guys are saying something else, then you also go along with them. That's called group think. Right? So that's dangerous because you could be correct. So why should you blindly follow everyone else when you are correct? And in, 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 in the corporate world, that's, that's also, you find it quite often. Because if the CEO or the managing director, if he's sitting in meetings, and one thing you teach them is that the chairman must speak last. If any decision has to be taken, he must speak last. Get everyone's views, and then he give his view. Because if the chairperson gives his view in the beginning, then the other people just fall in. And even if you've got a different view, and you junior, you won't want to go against him. See? So that's what we teach them also about how to conduct meetings. So that's not right what you said. Right, you have your hand up and lucky you are. The people sometimes might be right. Come to think about that. You have to put that in your mind every single point you your being. Yes. They might be right. They could also be right. Uh, in my opinion, you do not give an answer in the truth. Mm -hmm. You have to ask for another chance. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I learned from this exercise that I could be wrong. I do my own work in a rush. Mm -hmm. And I have to respect others if I do the rush and uh, it may fall, I will be just. Okay, so what, what came out of it is we are not always right. We are not always right. And quite often, Quite often we're wrong, but we don't accept the other person's view. Isn't that so? That's what we were doing, you are wrong, I am right, that sort of thing, right? Only one person said that uh, I'm not sure they could be right, I could be wrong, right? So what is it that prevents us from admitting that we could be wrong? What prevents us from admitting that we could be wrong? Arrogance. Arrogance? What else? Feeling embarrassed. Sorry? Feeling embarrassed or embarrassed. Feeling embarrassed? What else? Hmm? Ego. Sorry? Ego. Ego. Ego, right? Anything else? Losing trust. <laughs> Losing? Trust. Losing trust of others, okay? One-minded. Uh, One-minded. One-minded, okay. I went for the workshop recently, and that was similar to what I'm doing, but that person was conducting it from a Sharia perspective. And he said, that, see, you get an external, external uh, perspective and an internal perspective. Externally, we can't control what's happening externally. Isn't that so? The weather is like this, we can't do anything about it. Someone has knocked into your vehicle, not your fault, you can't do anything about it. Someone has come and blocked your driveway, you have to drive into your, into your garage, he's blocked your driveway, that's external, you can't control that normally. But internally, you can control it. How you feel, how you interpret what's happening outside, you can control. And because he was doing from a Sharia perspective, he said that internally also, there is the one voice is of Allah SWT. The other voice is of Shaitan. Voice in inverted commas, right? So, with Allah SWT, that is you submitting. <coughs> Our deen is submission. Islam is submission. So that is submitting. And shaitan? Is shaitan submitting? He please, did he submit in the first first instant? He did not submit. Why did he not submit? Because he was? Because of his ego, he was arrogant, created from fire, created from clay. See, so internally, 
there's these two uh, different things. One is what the Sharia says, and the other is what Shaitan says. We can control what's inside us. We can either go the root of Sharia, or we can go the root of Shaitan. Right? If we go the root of Shaitan, then we're going to deny. If anything happens, I'm right. My ego. Isn't that so? So what you need to do, the whole exercise, a few days of workshop that we do, is to try and change your internal thinking. Because what you do externally is a reflection of what's going on in your mind internally. So if the person has come and blocked your driveway and you are cross, you want to come out and you want to shout and you want to hit him, right? So you will react from what's going through your mind. So either the submission part, submission meaning that you look for a solution. And, and the, on the denial side, you want to swap him out. See? So even this exercise that we did was in order to try and get you to think on the correct side, not the shaitani voice coming out. Absolutely. Okay. So what was preventing us from admitting that we might be wrong is that internal voice that's telling us that denying that we can't be wrong. I am a CEO. I am a leader. So even in leadership, I'm a leader. So everyone else must be wrong. The point that a brother made is that you don't want to show that you are wrong. Quite often in leadership, you don't want to show others that you could be wrong. Right? Because it could be embarrassing. But a true leader is one who admits when he's wrong. Okay. Yes? Did, did I change? Yes. Yeah? The passage. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> he, said, he said I might have changed it. No, I didn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't have counted eight twice then. <laughs> Isn't that so? Yes. Good. Okay. Right, now we're going to be doing something very interesting. Okay, we've been going for one hour. Let's take a two minutes break. 21 passes. People in the white only. To the ground and to the people. Well, from one person to the other. One person to the other? Yes. He said... Uh, no, no, whether it's thrown there or whether it's thrown to the ground, that's one pass. Yeah, to the ground and back. Yes. To them, that's mm. one pass. Yes. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. How many you counted? 15. Well, I'm down to one. That's 14 to 15. 14 to 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. How many? 16. 16. 16. 16. 16. You're not. <laughs> not sure. <laughs> I think uh, may I know exercise. Some, something. No, but we're talking about accounting. How many you counted? 10. 10? <laughs> you're sure it's 10? Not sure. I'm this time I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Okay. About 11. About 11. About 11. Right. About 11. So. They were 15. Right, they were 15, and he showed it to us just now. Yes? Yes. You are 15. 15, okay. The next question. No one must speak. The next question. Did you notice anything else? Yes. Just just raise your hand. Don't don't speak. Just raise your hand. Then I'll ask what you saw. Okay. Did you notice anything else yeah. while that whole game was carrying on? Yeah. But I'll ask you just now. Those who raise their hand. Have you noticed anything else? Why those people are playing basketball? No one else besides one, two, three, four, five. No one else notice anything else. No. Okay. Let's start with you and then of course. What did you notice? Yeah, there was something like a monster. Yeah. 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 Let me speak. I'll come to you. What did you notice? A monster going past. Yeah. And doing what? Uh, just what? The next side. A monster walked past. Yeah. Like it's not a monster. <laughs> What you saw? Yeah, we're right. He's in the middle, just raising his hand. Okay. What you saw? Same thing. Like we're not that monster. Yeah. Doing what? Dancing. Dancing and doing like that. 
Yeah. What do you say? C. C. Doing what? Uh, just like first try and just do like. Maybe the end. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you say? Like gorilla dancing. Like gorilla dancing. How it was dancing? Yeah. What it was doing? I'm so proud of him. Thank you, Odessa. Gorilla is there, but uh, he was counting the numbers, maybe. Gorilla <laughs> was counting numbers also, okay. <laughs> and what did you show? You saw anything? Well, I think uh, both they do the same. Uh, same what? The same. Uh, Passing the ball. Passing. Yeah, but did you see anything else? You didn't see anything else? <laughs> they, they are playing in bad, uh, bad area. Okay, right, let, let's see, let's see. Correct, the correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? Yes. <laughs> This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is... Well, this isn't true. Huh? Not true? No, he said it was not visible to him while he's counting. The girl is passing, the majority did not see it. You didn't see it? Why didn't you see it? Because you are concentrating on something. Concentrate. You're concentrating on one thing. And that's why the rest of you also didn't see the gorilla. Hmm? Concentrating on one thing. And in real life, what happens normally? Yes, the same. It's like that. Hmm? See what we like to see. Other things we don't like, we will not see. Okay, so in real life also, we just, uh, we don't notice everything. Yes. Yeah, I want you to Observe very clearly, uh, carefully again, please, right? And I'm going to ask you, well, the gentleman's going to ask you a question, and you must respond. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. <coughs> I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. I, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Right. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Right, how observant were you? You saw something. You saw that whole clip. Did you see anything different, anything changing during the course of... Uh, okay, let's start. What did you see? There was someone missing. Just next to that one. Yeah. Someone next to where? That girl. Next to the girl? Yeah. Yes. There was someone, then it changed. And then it changed to this? Yeah. Right? What you saw? The, the dead body changed. Dead body? So How it changed? What happened? He had the black hair. He had the? Black hair. Black hair. Now you've got white hair. Okay, what you saw? Uh, the body. Uh, yes. The clothes have been changed. Clothes have been changed. Okay, the three things so far. Who else saw anything different? He was blind. Sorry? You mean he was without hair? Blind. Who was without hair? Yeah, dead body. Dead body? Yeah. So someone said he had black hair. Yeah, blind. You think that he had no hair? Okay. Uh, the lady has lipstick. Uh, lady has lipstick? No, there's uh, a green one. Thank you, man. Like, I think he <laughs> was taken. <laughs> <laughs> Very sharp eyes. <laughs> okay, so he says she had lipstick, right? What else? He wasn't uh, wearing glasses. She did not wear glasses. No, no, the, 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 the dead body. The dead body did not have glasses. Okay, so there's four things so far. The lady didn't wear the socks. Oh, she did not have that uh, pantyhose. 
Okay. From so far, it's like... Right, okay, we don't have it. So far, fine. The detective had uh, uh, a red uh, 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 hat. Red hat, not a black hat. Okay, we'll see about that. Yes. He was not wearing gloves. Okay. <coughs> That's seven so far. Anyone else saw anything? Um, was there a chair before the Was there a chair? I'm not sure. I'll check out this map, please. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, there's there's a bit there's something to change with the, the hand of man, okay? The man's hand, yeah. yes. Change, okay, with the what is it? The glove or is it the thing no, he's holding? No, 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 it's holding. What is holding a chair? <laughs> He has a yeah. Okay, okay. We'll have a look. The hat was bright brown. The hat was? Bright brown. This one here? Yeah. Okay. The picture I think is here. The picture is here. Which one? The both. Both? What were they before? Yeah. You don't know, but it's different. <laughs> okay. That was a different group. Who? Different group. <laughs> different group. <laughs> different group. <laughs> different group. Different video. Different video. <laughs> okay. You don't this now. Anyone else? Okay. So it's about eight different things or so. I haven't seen the, uh, the map before. The map? So you think the map has changed also? It was added. The map was added. Okay, that's nine. Anyone, anyone else have anything else? <coughs> no. Well, let's see how observant we were. The time, maybe. The? Who's ties? He's tied. Yeah. They are just making some assumptions. Yeah, I know. They just. Yeah, yeah you also can say something. <laughs> no, no. Okay, okay. Right. Let's look. Let's look. Let's look. Twenty-one changes. What were they? Uh, okay. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe. Who? at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts and precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's goes below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. <coughs> Sorry? Do it again? Okay. Let's do it again. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Okay. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, mm. Clearly, okay. somebody in this room <laughs> murdered no. Lord Smythe, <laughs> who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. But I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. Yeah. Okay. What's the point? That's the question I'm going to ask you. What's the point? What is the point? Hmm? 
things that you don't see. see if someone is walking on the pavement, the child there may be attempting to run. So if what you're saying is that we must only have a look at what we are supposed to be doing in, in normal life and don't worry too much about the other things. You can't observe everything, but you must not be oblivious of the other things that's happening around you. Yeah, that, that's right. What I want to, what right. I so so the, the point is quite often in, in our everyday life, we are so focused on the one thing that we don't see the bigger picture. It happens to all of us. We are so focused, for instance, even that basketball, when you're just counting, someone told you count the number of passes. So we are focusing on counting the number of passes. And yet when the gorilla walked directly in front of us, some of us did not notice it at all. Right? That's happening in real life. We are so focused on our everyday work that other things that are happening around us that we should be looking at. You should be noticing. You can't notice everything, but you can't not notice anything also. See, so that's the that's the point that's being made. Any other comments? On leadership? Yes. Uh, I would uh, see something interesting in the film that uh, uh, you might have uh, a chance of skipping things uh, so important when you are concentrating in, in, in one direction, you have to go and see 360 degree around you. And this is the reason why we sometimes uh, have difficulty in leadership. Mm -hmm. You have to look at all the surrounding you. That's the main point. Okay, any other comments? I think my time is up now. Uh, Shake will be coming in now in about five minutes' time. So, any general comments on what we've discussed thus far? What we've discussed was uh, perceptions. We looked at uh, those different clips. We looked at the, the clip regarding the, the apps. So, one of the perceptions, the other was whether we're right, whether we're wrong, and thirdly, whether we're noticing everything. As I mentioned, this. This type of workshop takes me between three and five days. So this, I've taken out about 45 minutes, so say one and a half hours of the three days to workshop. Right? But so, to recap, what was the intention of doing some of these things? Especially those of you who are here from, from the beginning, you'll understand. What was the whole object of what we did as leaders? What was the first verse of the Holy Quran that I referred to? About change? About change? Correct. Right. So, in, in leadership, in presentations and so forth, you get a lot of principles, right? Which is in this place, you need to know the principles. And one of the principles that you learned in those few days that you have been in Durban is the first principle of leadership. And Ahmed Sheikh did with you. What is the first principle of leadership? Change yourself change yourself. That's a principle. How do you implement it? Implementation is very difficult. Principles are easy. You can read books, you get principles. Presentations, you get principles. 
implementation part, that's a difficult part. And it's very easy to tell people what to do, to try and change people. To change yourself, that is a real test. Very difficult to change oneself. So the three to five day workshop that we do is the whole thing is to change your own mind, to change your own self before you can try changing others. And as leaders, you are in, you are in a position of power. So people listen to you, whether you're talking nonsense or not, they're going to listen to you. Out of fear more than anything else. Right? But if you really want to change the people who are under you, you need to change yourself. And you need to apologize also if you are wrong. And you should also look at things from their point. Quite often we look at things from our point. Right? So although I only saw six Fs, you saw seven Fs, I did not see what you saw. I can't say that you're wrong. I did not see what you saw. Right? So these are some of the things that we wanted to get across. OK, anything else? Any questions? No questions. OK, we're going to just see if um, Sashek is available. And until he comes, let's just. Uh, I mean, the, just one thing. You yes. have this kind of tools. There's one website. Uh, all this kind of good, or you're just right but while we're waiting let's just uh, end on a lighter note <coughs> I bought something from you last week and I'm very disappointed oh yeah What's the problem? Yeah, well, my Blackberry is not working. He's on his way. Yeah, yeah tell him that we're ready. As soon as he comes in. I bought something from you last week, and I'm very disappointed. Oh, yeah? What's the problem? Yeah, well, my Blackberry is not working. <laughs> hey. What's the matter? You've run out of juice? <laughs> No, it's completely frozen. <laughs> oh yeah, I can see that. I'll tell you what, let's try it on orange. <laughs> We're talking about blackberry and cell phone. That's got a few black spots, you see. Oh dear, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, then how do you get my blackberry working? Well, it could be an application issue. But where do you store that blackberry? Well, it's on my desktop. Well, you could try using a mouse to drag the blackberry to the trash. <laughs> then after you've done that, you might want to launch the blackberry from the desktop. <laughs> well, I've already tried that a few times. I mean, all it did was mess up windows. <laughs> well, it might be worth waiting a couple of weeks. they got the latest blackberries coming in then. Well, could you give me a date? Certainly. <laughs> Let me put that date in my diary. <laughs> Anything else I can help you with? Yes, yes, I've also got a problem, to be honest, with my apple. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, that is an old apple, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when did you buy that? Yeah, last week. Last week? <laughs> they brought out two new apples since then. <laughs> What's the problem with it? Well, I've tried to put my dongle in it, and <laughs> it won't fit. Oh yeah. <laughs> and how big's your dongle? Well, I don't know much about these things, but my wife's seen a few dongles in her time. <laughs> and she says it's a little bit on the small side. <laughs> well, I'm afraid there's not a lot I can do about that. <laughs> Tell you what, let me try booting it. <laughs> It's crashed. <laughs> <laughs> Any
Anything else I can help you with? Well, funnily enough, yes, my grandson's birthday suit, you oh, see. Yeah. Now, it's already got an apple and a blackberry. I mean, have you got anything else that you might just like? Well, we're doing a special offer on these. I mean, I can't make Adam Taylor them, but the kids seem to like them. Okay. Xbox. Xbox. <laughs>